so we tested Maria Elsa's microphone, besides microphone. So Maria Fernanda, do you think you could please say something to for us to test your microphone? Can you hear us? Okay, Swaran, can we test your microphone, please? Hi, Ludwig. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, Swaran, can you hear us well? Yes, yes, I can hear you fine, and I can see everyone as well. Great, thank you. So, Maria Fernanda, you can't. Okay. Iglika, can we please test yours? I can hear you very clearly, and Good. I hope that you can too. We can, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Sadaf? Hello, Hi. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well, thank you very much. Great. And Adi? Adi Uzul? Can you hear us? Her mic is mute and she cannot un unmute apparently. Adiuzul, uh, we can try to unmute Adiuzul here. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Ah, good. And now I can, can see you and hear you clearly. Yeah, hope you can hear me and see me well. <laughs> yes. Anelia, would you also be intervening with Iglika or it's just Iglika? Anelia, I believe can you that hear us? It's only me. I believe it, it's only me uh, okay. for the uh, presentation and intervening in the Q&A part. Good. Okay, Maria Fernanda, can we test your microphone as well then? Yes, now I can, thank you. Great. Um, Grace? Hi. And Karen, Camila, and Xiaojie, can you hear us well? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes, perfectly as well. Great, Xiaojie. Can you hear us, Xiaojie? Can we test your microphone as well? I don't know if she's here for now, maybe. Uh, but she's can... sending a message. Uh... Okay, Xiaojie can hear us, but uh, her microphone is not on. She can't. Uh...
Hello, everyone. Hello again. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, those who are um, sorry. Um, apologies about that. Uh, hello again, and thank you so very much for being here with us in the room today. And thank you so much for the participants who joined us online, to the participants and speakers. Um, I am very happy to welcome you all on behalf of UNESCO to this uh, session, which is de uh, dedicated to UNESCO's Internet Universality Romex Indicators, um, uh, which is a unique tool um, for measuring the internet development and the development of digital environment uh, in a given in a in a country at the national level, uh, based on um, on uh, on the principles which we've been talking. Uh, we will be talking about about and I'll have a presentation on that. Um, so we are very excited to be here and we have uh, uh, distinguished uh, speakers here as well as online. And without uh, further ado, I'd like to give the floor uh, to uh, UNESCO's Director of the Division for Digital Inclusion um, and Policies um, and Digital Transformation um, and the Secretary of the Information uh, for All program, uh, Ms. Maria Elza uh, Oliveira, um, uh, to address her opening remarks. Please, please Maria Elza, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tate Vic. Um, hi, uh, everyone. You know, it's really great to see you at the IGF 2023 and I'm super glad that UNESCO team can start our interventions uh, uh, of this week with the Internet Universality Indicators uh, Day Zero session. So welcome everyone and I really wish I could be with you today but this year we have an overlap on dates of the IGF and, the, and UNESCO's governing body so we can't travel there. But I really join you with a lot of enthusiasm as this year, there's much change going on, both for internet governance and for the internet universality indicators. Since 2018, the UNESCO Romax indicators have served as a unique and comprehensive tool to help countries voluntarily assess their digital landscape based on the five guiding principles that we all uh, work towards. Uh, we advocate together for an internet that is our human rights based, O, open to all, A, accessible by all, and nurtured by M, most stakeholder participation, and also that address the cross-cutting issues such as gender and safety. More importantly, the Romax assessment actually leads to the design of policies that support an inclusive, open, safe internet for all users. This is one of the ways in which UNESCO supports policies that nurture this human-centered internet, the internet we all want. In the five years since UNESCO member states endorsed the Romax indicators, we have made enormous strides together. Over 40 countries from all regions of the world have completed or are underway with a national Romax assessment. <clears throat> And several countries are adding their unique ideas to the approach. You know, a great example is Kenya, which piloted a follow-up assessment to measure the impact of the Romax approach on their national internet ecosystem after they started implementing the policies. This is groundbreaking and really exciting. But the internet has also changed significantly in these five years. We have seen over 1 billion new users join. We have seen acceleration of the global digital transformation process, especially in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have e-commerce, e-government, e-learning, e-everything having exponential growth. We have seen the rise of frontier technologies like artificial intelligence, augmented reality, blockchain, and others. But we also have realized the many ways in which the internet can harm, from fragmentation to misinformation and hate speech. We have seen internet governance evolving to address these issues with you know, the creation in the UN system of a tech and voice office. And now you know, the upcoming um, multi stakeholder body for artificial intelligence. It is time then for a change for the IUIs as well. So that's why in collaboration with UNESCO category two centers at tick.br, 
UNESCO is currently in the process of revising the Romax framework. So make sure that we continue having relevance in this, uh, of these indicators and that they adapt to this new digital in environment. The Internet Governance Forum is the place where we come together to collectively shape the Internet. And this session will have to shape, shape the IUIs as well. We will learn from various different experiences of implementing the framework in different contexts and leverage our collective expertise to draw lessons that benefit our digital community. And I'm really grateful to the Rome uh, X community. We have grown together as we support each other. You guys are such a generous community who is making the digital world better. So today, we will hear from researchers and stakeholders from different regions of the world who will share their insights and perspectives on Romax implementation. I, I, let me ask all speakers and all participants to share both the good and the bad. What opportunities the Romax framework has opened in your countries for advancing internet development, but also point out some of the challenges we have yet to address. This would be immensely helpful to us because your insights on the discussions to be held today will contribute to the revision of the internet universality indicators. This important process will certainly be informed by your rich experience and expertise. I have no doubt that in the past years, our day zero discussions have proved, uh, like in the past years, it's, it, it's, it will prove super productive enabling mutual learning and the strengthening of our collective efforts towards real internet universality. We will succeed if we keep in mind that the internet is a shared global resource that really has been touching every aspect of our lives. It is our collective responsibility to ensure it upholds human rights and the values of openness and inclusivity as it evolves. So let me thank you all again for the contributions you have made to the Rome framework in the past, for joining us here today, and for being so generous with your experience sharing that will shape our framework in the future. Where I really can't wait to hear your insights and I wish you a fabulous session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you uh, for your guidance, strategic guidance um, over the years and uh, for your strong support for, for this project and uh, for your contribution and welcoming remar remarks. Uh, so um, I, will, I will proceed with, uh, with my presentation. Uh, just to elaborate, um, Maria, I gave uh, an excellent overview, but uh, just for me to elaborate on um, uh, on a bit more on the Internet Universality Framework and uh, and the progress uh, in uh, across the world. Great, so we can see my slides now. I hope the online participants can also see it well. Uh, so just to present myself, I'm Tatevi Grigorian, an os Associate Program Specialist at UNESCO. Uh, I'm coordinating the um, IEI Romex project at UNESCO. Um, I have my contact here for, uh, for further reach uh, after, after the discussion. Uh, so just to also go back uh, to the start of the um, uh, IUI Romex indicators. Uh, so at the uh, 38th uh, General Conference of UNESCO, which is the governing body of UNESCO uh, back in 2018, uh, the General Conference um, and the member states endorsed the concept of internet universality and uh, uh, the principles, Rome principles, meaning that uh, internet should be universal and based on human rights, be open and uh, accessible to all, nurtured by multi-stakeholder participation. And um, cross-cutting issues were also introduced into this framework to address issues such as uh, gender equality, environment, safety and security, um, and sustainable development. Um, uh, sustainable development. Um, and what is Romex framework? Romex framework is. Um, 
uh, is a set of indicators, 303 indicators, um, and 100 of nine of which is core indicators that measure the development of the internet uh, at the national level of the country, um, taking uh, uh, using the internet universality indicators um, and principles. Um, and the idea is to develop a clear and substantive un understanding of the uh, internet environment um, and uh, map uh, map the overall situation and identify uh, ev any gaps that are out there um, and assess um, um, assess uh, the possibilities the opportunities and challenges and formulate actionable policy recommendations for all um, all stakeholders concerned to um, to address any gaps uh, that were uh, addressed during the assessment um, um, and where does it come from? So just to to make the link between uh, the UNESCO's uh, mandate, uh, one of the mandates, which is a uh, free flow of, a flow of ideas, um, uh, which uh, which is um, uh, uh, addressed by uh, UNESCO's uh, communication and information sector, which works on a number if, uh, of issues, including uh, digital uh, transformation um, and ensuring universal internet access and um, a human rights-based uh, approach, and also making link between uh, strategies um, and frameworks out there, and including uh, the sustainable development uh, goals, addressing uh, a number of them and overall addressing those and uh, making a link with uh, di global digital compact. Um, and it is really, uh, these assessments can really help um, uh, nurture this, uh, this compact as, uh, for example, in the core, um, uh, it's uh, to address, uh, for example, digital divides um, and uh, human rights online. Um, and uh, I want to highlight a couple of um, ideas and uh, relating uh, related to the framework. So the idea of these assessments is really um, to have it uh, at the national level and to help uh, the countries to have the understanding and move forward with their digital agendas and contribute with the uh, with. Um, evidence-based inf information, so it is not uh, to create any ranking uh, among the countries, uh, although there, um, the, the countries which can look at each other's example, but uh, there is no idea to have an, uh, a ranking of any sort, but really to help the countries. And um, it's um, it has really um, this evidence-based appro approach, uh, which addresses uh, a number of themes, uh, whether it's legal policy, regulatory frameworks, uh, measuring human rights, uh, whether it's a, uh, a measuring multi-stakeholder approach. Um, so there is a very clear focus on digital inclusion dimensions, as I mentioned, which we um, we have cross-cutting issues such as gender, youth, uh, people with disabilities, um, or uh, minority groups such as la uh, language minorities. Uh, so what we also highlight uh, as a very important aspect is the process, um, and I will be speaking a bit more about the process, but um, it's a really, uh, we, we focus a lot on the methodology and uh, um, and the process of establishing this multi-stakeholder approach to make sure that every stakeholder concerned is involved and their voice is heard. And of course, um, I would like to highlight that we really have this solid evidence-based approach uh, which uh, fits the uh, assessment. Um, so as I mentioned, we have uh, 303 indicators uh, in total. Uh, so the number uh, may be a bit scary, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, so the reason why there are so many indicators uh, is that we really want to capture the um, cu cultural and the cultural environment and make sure that the it's adapted to a country conte uh, context. So we recommend that 109 indicators, which are uh, the basis, um, are employed and tested. Uh, 
uh, assessed in the, in the country. And then we strongly recommend uh, uh, the country to look at which of these uh, additional indicators are relevant for their uh, context, uh, country context, so that uh, uh, they complement uh, these 109 indicators and uh, capture the actual um, holistic um, situation. Uh, so we have these five categories that I mentioned, uh, rights, openness, accessibility, multi-stakeholder participation, and uh, cross-cutting issues, which form the ROMEX abbreviation. And we have uh, seen, uh, six themes and a number of questions. And just to give you a, a, um, an overlook, uh, so uh, we have uh, these themes uh, under each category. But for example, here, um, which we note uh, and as pointed uh, by the experts as well. Um, so uh, there are, uh, for example, themes which are, uh, are across the uh, across each uh, theme. For example, policy, legal, and regu regulatory framework are across uh, each uh, um, each theme. For example, um, and. Here I would just I, I just wanted to illustrate um, uh, the sort of the structure. So, uh, for example, if we take under the rights, uh, if we take the rights um, uh, on the theme, and for example, uh, specifically rights to pri uh, privacy, then for each theme we will have a specific question which is displayed here, and then this question that helps. Um, so the question is, is the protection of personal data guaranteed in law and enforced in practice with respect to government, businesses, and other organizations, including rights of uh, access to information um, uh, and uh, held to, sorry, held to, um, to redress, sorry. And the in, uh, this question helps then uh, uh, address the indicator um, uh, of uh, existence and power of uh, an independent data protection authority or similar entity. So it's really, um, the framework really facilitates the work. Uh, well, experts will talk uh, a bit more about that. Uh, so uh, to really capture the overall situation. And for example, a recommendation that arose out of, um, uh, while assessing this indicator was uh, to create an independent national personal data protection authority and a national council for the protection of personal data, making the normative framework enforce uh, consistent with the enhancement uh, enactment of the personal data protection law. This is just to give uh, an idea. Uh, so as uh, Maria Elza mentioned, we have a number of countries across uh, the five continents that um, have, uh, have um, uh, published the report, finished and published the report. Um, and currently we have 34 countries uh, where the assessment is ongoing. And these are countries that have just launched or approaching uh, or finalized or approaching the finalization of the uh, reports. So out of uh, these uh, 34 ongoing countries, 13 are in Africa, uh, 12 uh, in Asia Pacific, two in Arab states, Latin America and the Caribbean, six countries and three countries in Europe. So we have uh, representation here, lead, uh, researchers from uh, almost all continents, so they will elaborate more. Um, on on the process in their countries, and actually we have uh, six published uh, re reports at the moment um, uh, since uh, we started the publication since 2019. And uh, mm, uh, Brazil was one of the first, uh, and Kenya as well, and uh, lead researchers will talk uh, about that. So I would invite you all to, I have the link there, I would uh, really invite you to um, to which reminds me that I also have some copies here which I will distribute afterwards. Uh, I invite you to go to our website to have a look um, at, the, at the publications to have a better understanding and of course to see um, the recommendations, for example, and the process. Uh uh, yes, as I speak about the process, um, I want to highlight eight uh, steps which we have while we while the assessments are carried out. 
Um, uh, so, um, uh, as I mentioned, it's a voluntary assessment, meaning that the national stakeholders initiate the assessments themselves, and there is a very strong local ownership. So, um, and UNESCO's role is to facilitate the process and provide technical assistance and support to the researchers, to the multi-stakeholder advisory board to help them um, carry out the, uh, the process. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the uh, multi-stakeholder approach uh, a lot. So the assessment starts with uh, with um, uh, s establishing uh, a multi-stakeholder advisory board, which consists of government representatives, relative uh, ministries, academia, private sector, civil society organizations, um, and all the relevant uh, stakeholders, uh, also based uh, on the context of the country. Um, um, uh, these are the people, this is the group which will be consulted uh, since the beginning, for example, uh, from um, where to collect data, how to collect data, they, the, to the validation process where all these stakeholders uh, representing different stakeholder groups then um, then really validate the report and uh, agree that uh, this is the situation uh, that really reflects uh, the content, uh, the, the, uh, the situation in the country. And then, of course, um, I, I won't go through all the steps, but uh, I would also uh, mention the research uh, group. Establishing a research group um, is uh, also an important step. So uh, we have lead researchers uh, who are here, but also given the, that uh, it's a diverse and it's a very comprehensive framework and it requires diverse expertise, um, uh, people with all this expertise uh, then gather together to form the group and ensure that each topic um, and each theme is uh, really covered with an expert approach. Um, and um, and um, then there is the data ga gathering where we can see also challenges, but I won't elaborate and as, uh, as uh, researchers can talk about that. Um, I would also highlight the, um, the face of uh, impact assessment and monitoring. So the um, assessment doesn't end uh, when the validation is there um, and validation is completed, but also there are mechanisms and we are improving the mechanisms for follow up uh, and monitoring. And then actually, um, then further assess, uh, assessment or further actions are taken to to see uh, what has changed um, since uh, since the report was published, and we have an excellent example of Kenya. Uh, who will uh, speak about that. So here are just a few examples of, for example, impact that IUI made on national policies. Uh, I would really like to highlight that uh, the, um, uh, these IUI assessments are, uh, are really essential for uh, countries which, developed countries, developing countries. So it doesn't uh, really depend on the development status of the digital ecosystem because there is always uh, room for improvement and uh, we have, uh, for example, Germany has carried out the assessment and we have distinguished colleague uh, online who will talk about it. Uh, for example, uh, IUI recommendations in Germany were uh, proposed to the parliament and the topics raised by IUI recommendations were then reflected in the coalition treaty 2021-2026 or for Senegal, IUI assessments of assessment facilitated the implementation of the 2025 str uh, digital strategy for the country and of the high-speed uh, national plan. So these are just uh, two examples, or on the screen a few examples, uh, but we, uh, we have seen very excellent examples of how these assessments made an impact. Uh, okay, I arrive on my, I'll, I'll leave this here, but uh, so just to also mention that um, uh, so uh, we do understand that we're dealing with the internet and digital ecosystem and uh, a topic and an environment and area which is evolving very, very rapidly. So uh, the idea, since we had this uh, IUI framework, the idea was to ensure its ongoing relevance and um, 
uh, to do that, uh, we planned to, we gave ourselves this uh, five year uh, period and um, with the idea to review the framework uh, every five years and uh, to, of course, this can be reviewed, but um, the, the plan is to review it and to see the development, technological developments, um, and to make sure that the framework remains relevant and um, uh, at, uh, relevant uh, addressing uh, the current um, uh, technological advancements. Uh, so we are reaching this five-year mark in 2024, but um, so um, back in the last year's IGF in Ethiopia, we started consultations um, and discussions with um, lead researchers, with experts uh, to, to really assess um, and understand uh, whether it's uh, really the good moment to update the IUI framework and uh, we did uh, uh, reach uh, this conclusion and we have actually started taking concrete actions towards this uh, revision of the IUIs um, and we are working with uh, with CETIC uh, who is uh, uh, that is a, a category UNESCO category 2 center and Fabio will present more about the um, about the center um, we have uh, Fabio here and Alessandra here in the audience who have been driving this work uh, forward in coordination with UNESCO and I will give the floor to Fabio now to um, to present a bit more about the IUI pro uh, revision process. But before that, I would uh, invite uh, people to check um, uh, check our website um, to, to check the assessments and uh, the framework and to see how you can uh, get uh, engaged. We have, um, we have a, a dynamic coalition, actually IGF dynamic coalition on internet universality indicators. And I invite you all uh, to be part of this uh, coalition um, and uh, and really keep in touch uh, for any possible cooperation or any inquiries you may have. And we do have the dynamic coalition session um, on on Wednesday, and I will I will be announcing the details. But in the meantime, I'm giving the sorry a cable to uh, Fabio to to connect now. So I'll give uh, the flo uh, floor to Fabio and ask him to, to introduce himself. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tata Vic. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank UNESCO for the invitation and and also for putting together this such an international and, and interesting group of people to, to discuss those issues. My my presentation today will focus, as Tata Vic mentions, in, in the in the process of and what we learned from from these five years of uh, internet universality indicators assessments, and what are the possible future developments of of the framework, uh, I'm I'm sur survey uh, project coordinator at CETIC.br, and first I would like to uh, explain wh uh, why CETIC is doing this this work. So CETIC.br is a UNESCO Category 2 center linked to NIC.br, the, the Brazilian Network Information Center, and the CGI.br, which is the uh, which which covers the multi-stakeholder model for internet governance uh, in Brazil. Uh, CETIC ex as this uh, runs uh, service since 2005, and by 2011 we we uh, uh, were recognized as, as a UNESCO Category 2 center. Uh, especially uh, focus on Latin American and African Portuguese speaking countries. So, uh, and why why Brazil is 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 involved in this process? First of all, uh, uh, CETIC is, is participates uh, the, um, on the very inception of the process of the IUI. So, back in 2015, when UNESCO approved the the the, the concept of Rome in the in, in, in the General Conference, and then started the process of consultation to, to build the, the IUI framework. Uh, uh, CETIC helped to, to, to finance this, 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 this work and, and, and these studies. And then 
we, uh, by 2018, we participated in a pilot application of the of the indicators when they were not approved yet. And in Brazil wa was also the first country that launched the, the assessment in back in 2019. And since since then, because of our role, uh, regional role in, in Latin America, and, and, and because of this partnership with UNESCO, we supported lots of countries that uh, were implementing the, the, those types of assessments. So we did uh, peer reviews and, and also all other types of support to countries. And uh, in, in in this year, in 2013, uh, 2023, we s we uh, started to help with the revision of of the this five year revision process. So I'll tell a little bit about it. So as as Tatevik mentioned, the process of revision was was mentioned in in the, in the when when in the back in in 2019 when the document was published. So UNESCO understood that. In in five years, there there is there is a, a demand for for updating the indicators to see if the the indicators is still relevant uh, according to the context. So uh, we d we decided to support this first in March this year, but 2023 we support uh, we we helped uh, we provided UNESCO a report a, ba a background report. Uh, based on desk research, based on, on, on looking into each one of the country as assessment and, and also interviews and meet, meeting with partners. And then uh, in July, we started a consultation process we, uh, that we interviewed uh, lead researchers from different countries that implemented the, the assessment to understand difficulties and, and, and possible ideas for the, for the framework. And finally, in August, we started to develop a draft proposal that is still ongoing on how to to update the the, ind the indicators i think it's important to mention that uh, based on on all, all those consultations and interviews that we made with with, with leading researchers in the process we understood a few uh, main recognized benefits from from this from having this type of assessment first of all the the holistic perspective so we are not talking about understanding just one part just just one part of the situation just uh, access but what you are doing with access or just rights but have no access so th the idea of having a, an holistic perspective i think it's is well well recognized uh, some other thing is is iui as a roadmap for action so not not just because we have recommendations but also because in each area, you see, uh, uh, by looking into all the different indicators, you can see what is not going on in your country compared to other countries and, and everything, so that you, 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 you have a, a checklist of things to do. The idea that you have uh, not just evidence on, on legal uh, provisions, so what, what is, is provided by the law, but what is, what is happening in practice, in the policies uh, in practice, so th this is something important. Also, the flexibility of the approach of, of the of the framework, so uh, each country can adapt the number of indicators to to their reality, and also identify what's wha what are what are the what are the data gaps in your country. So, what what data you don't have and you need to produce because you you map to to the the indicators. So we decided to, to go into three different uh, discussions. So uh, uh, is there any revision necessary to the process itself? Because we know this is, this is a multi-stakeholder process, so you need to consult all, all, the, all, all the areas and in, in, in start by, by defining a multi-stakeholder advisory board. So how you can uh, improve this process of uh, multi-stakeholderism participation within the, the framework? If there are any methodological issues that we, we can improve, so indicators that are difficult to understand or to implement, and also if there are different uh, aspects of or, or substantive dimensions that are not covered in, and should be uh, covered in the, in, in the framework. So we went through all, all the, the assessment, the, the ones that were published, but also the ones that were in, in ongoing. And we saw that it, something that is very important, a prevalence of developing countries and countries in Africa in the, uh, using the framework, which I think is very uh, interesting to, uh, to understanding. 
and also the prevalence of countries that implemented the core indicators and, and not the full indicators, which also means that uh, there is some complexity in, 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 uh, in implementing the, the, the whole indicators part. And also, something that we discussed that I think we, we, we will come, come out today is, is the idea that we do need to, to have more, more tools for following up uh, when, when it has the assessment. I think Kenya will talk about this because they have the second assessment. But we also can, can have different types of follow-up uh, based on, on the process. So how, how do you follow up uh, on the main gaps? So how identify the main gaps, gaps in, a, in a particular country? How can you fo uh, add more le level of detail or some, or some part that you, you don't cover in the first assessment? The follow-up on or recommendations, so which recommendations were or not uh, implemented? And what are the relations of the, the IUI with other uh, uh, upcoming agendas, should, should as the Global Digital Compact and, and so on? And also the idea that something that we, we might come out uh, before this discussion on revisions is, is that crea creating more interactive, interactive and more interesting tools for, for visualizing the, the data and the results. There is something that several expert, uh, experts suggested, so such as creating heat maps or, or other types of visualization uh, to, to the results. And uh, just to say that, uh, to tell a little bit about the consultation. So some of you that are in this room participate in this consultation. So we, we interviewed in, in a qualitative approach more uh, around uh, 15 countries uh, in, an, in a quantitative approach to an to a online form. We reached uh, 27 responses from 23 countries. So we, we have a very large uh, process of consultations with those that implemented the 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 IUI and although uh, most most of the countries do think that the process is, is very comprehensive and, and very interesting for mapping the, the situations they also see the the complexity complexity of implementing this so uh, we need we need to balance uh, the, the 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 capability of being uh, holistic but at the same time being in, uh, imp uh, easy to implement. Uh, the the uh, availability of data is something that uh, lots of countries mention. So this is, I think, this is something critical. When you don't have data in in particular areas or disaggregated data, it's very difficult to to comply to to all the the indicators. And this is something that is happening in lots of countries, not just the developed countries, but also in in, in other countries. Uh, and of course, uh, we had. Uh, we have the COVID-19 pandemic during most of these implementations. So most of the implementations have very uh, strong difficulties in meeting the, the most stakeholder bodies because of the, the pandemic. I won't go into the, the details of the results, so how many, the percentage of, of countries that, that mention each one of the difficulties. But just to, to finish with a few uh, questions for the future. So, uh, First of all, there, there's, a zin there's an intention of defining a, 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 a small sample of new indicators that need to consider the developments in, uh, in the digital ecosystem in, in the, this past five years. So what are the group of indicators that can complement this, this uh, IOI framework that is already uh, being implemented? Is there any connection with other important agendas? Uh, one of them is the UN SDGs. So what are the connections between, for instance, the IOI and, and the SDGs that we need to, to understand? If there are any review of the wording of the indicators that, that can make them more under understandable and easy to apply. Uh, sometimes we, we need to to improve the organization of the framework itself, so ha having additional tools for, for countries. And uh, we are also evaluating and proposing the, uh, the re a reduction in the number of the, of the overall indicators. This is this is was considered desirable but, but by most of the countries, but ma maintaining the balance among categories in, in, a, in a holistic perspective, so how to to keep this balance in, 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 in place.
uh, we also are suggesting uh, uh, to, to have a more uh, 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 deeper relation with the SDGs. We are we, we are classifying all the the, the IOI indicators in relation to the SDGs. So not just those SDGs that really mention uh, in the targets and indicate in the SDG indicators that really mention uh, the ICTs, but those that have any any connection with SDGs. So how for instance, the idea of, of sustainable development can be, for instance, treated in the, the uh, IOI framework. So this is something that we are also working together with UNESCO. And finally, I'm, I'm not going to discuss this in details, but just to say that in this consultation process, a few areas of, of, of uh, new dimensions appeared a lot in, in the interviews. Uh, the first one were, uh, was artificial intelligence. So, uh, artificial intelligence is present in just one in the is just one indicator of the 303, because it was five years ago. But nowadays, we know that uh, artificial intelligence has an, has an impact in, in the internet environment. So, how do we need to deal with this? We have lots of discussion on platform regulation. UNESCO is working a lot of this. The idea of in introducing this idea of meaningful connectivity in into IOI. So do you need, in, in the accessibility part, we need to change something to connect more with this idea of meaningful connectivity. Uh, the, the UN also updated the, the general comment 25 on, on children's, uh, related to ch children's rights. So how do, I is there any, any updates that we do need to, to, to also implement in the IOI? The idea of sustainable development that I already mentioned, and other aspects of such as mental health and elderly. So, this is something. Thi this do not mean that we will cover all the all these issues in the revision, but just to say that there are a few dimensions that came out into this this process of, of consultation that we need to deal. So, this was uh, this is where we are, and I think uh, IGF will be a very good opportunity of of. Uh, have a, a deep understanding on what should we do and and, and to, to interact more in in this process. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, thank you to Setic for uh, for your um, excellent work uh, in. Um, you can keep the back um, uh, uh, regarding the uh, implementation of IUI in Brazil and also throughout the uh, past year um, uh, for contributing to the revision process. Uh, so, um, as Fabio mentioned, uh, uh, the four are like IGF are excellent opportunities for um, for us to uh, to bring um, together uh, diverse um, stakeholders and really discuss uh, uh, the process and it's uh, um, as it's an open consultative uh, process and we uh, we do want to hear from from everybody um, who who can contribute to to the revision process and um, in this spirit uh, we have uh, a number of speakers who have been engaged in the uh, implementation uh, of the IUI in their respective countries and um, we would like to invite uh, them to contribute to the discussion around the IUI revision by drawing also on their personal expertise and experience of implementing these indicators uh, in their countries and um, uh, constru uh, we constructed the discussion around the themes of the IUI um, uh, while also making sure um, we address a number of questions uh, which I won't be reading out, uh, but uh, around questions around how to improve, uh, for example, multi-stakeholder advisory group um, process uh, or based uh, how to address the data gap uh, challenges or how to what strategies to help uh, to to uh, uh, establish to to improve the follow-up process and uh, overall the process and also so, of course, addressing the um, uh, topics of like uh, new themes to be included. 
Um, we will start uh, the discussion around the category um, rights, and um, I, I have four speakers who will uh, specifically to uh, talk uh, about the topic and, of course, drawing on the, their personal experience. And I first invite uh, Claire Melanie Popineau uh, from France uh, to, 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 to uh, address us, and please, if you. Thank you. Um, bonjour à, à toutes et tous. Uh, I'm very glad to, to be here. Arigato Nihon. Um, today I will presen present uh, you uh, two points arising from the experience of France regarding the IUI. <coughs> First, the contextual indicators which will lead me on the second point regarding rights. First, um, the advanced version of the draft allows me to speak about the relevance to include in the study those contextual uh, indicators. Um, there are essential elements of understanding, perspective, and comparison for all other indicators. Uh, I will take just a few examples uh, of what I say. Uh, for example, depending on the level as a gross nas national income, the connectivity rate indicators does not have the same meaning, it's clear. Another example, the age pyramid, it leads to a necessary questioning of the accessibility of elderly people, as well as the birth rate with the need for education of young people on the internet. Um, another example um, where we see that rights and indicators are very intricate. Um, the new, the uh, the new, yeah, new, the new existence of an obligation to attend school from the age of three impacts very strongly the scolarization rate. For example, the frequentation of child of three years and a half was at 1990 uh, percent, 99.48 percent uh, in 2021 in France. Uh, 100%, uh, 100, <laughs> um, uh, some, uh, some 100 percent of, of boys and uh, a bit less uh, for, for girls, but uh, I it's it's very important to to understand the big picture in a country to 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 regard to to analyze uh, well the the other indicators. And maybe uh, a last example of what I say is um, the literacy rate. Uh, illiteracy is a very uh, important matter in, in France, uh, even if uh, the, the scolarization is very good. Um, and it is a criteria uh, which is not r only related with internet, but I I it is a, a major uh, accessibility uh, issue uh, in France in a certain category of people. So, uh, lesson learned here, uh, like in many subjects, Internet is not a separate subject, but uh, at the confluence of social, political, and economic issues. And uh, it is very important to maintain uh, um, the indicator at the beginning of the, of the study and even uh, during the study to, to stay uh, very close of the, of the issue of a country. Um, those, context uh, sorry, those contextual indicators lead to targeting the essential issue. A lot of S already in my oh <laughs> um, In France, um, um, for, for example, uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, electricity access, uh, etc., is not uh, uh, an issue in France uh, uh, at the same. St um, but uh, so uh, the interpretation cannot be the same uh, between uh, two countries uh, regarding the indicator. And that's why you said it. Uh, it's not a, a purpose of comparison, but uh, to enlighten uh, maybe uh, the way to address uh, the issue. And no question of rights. Um, looking at the series of more specific indicators with uh, regard to their number, uh, their scope, and the multi uh, stakeholder, multi party, and multi stakeholder dimension in uh, our uh, work group, uh, discus discussions are still going strong because um, even if a certain number of objective elements uh, are 
observed and exist uh, to read the indicators, uh, their weight, the, 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 their, their rate I, I in the final evaluation of the indicator remains under discussion. I will explain <laughs> maybe a, a, a bit clearly that I say. For example, on the internet on childhood, the stakeholder conclusions diverge uh, to some, some extent. Um, during a, um, a working session uh, on the place of a judge in the digital space uh, organized uh, last July uh, uh, by Irest and Isaac French chapter, uh, the there was a question uh, regarding the rule of law and um, and uh, uh, some critics regarding the tendency to create ad hoc and infralegal procedures to resolve disputes, uh, particularly regarding the removal of online content, pornography, uh, harassment, etc. Um, all specific and new procedures can give the impression that the indicator is very good because there is procedure. But in reality, um, it, the question of effectiveness and the state of duty and uh, and balance of rights are are questioned here. So it's not easy with the with the same fact, the same law, the same uh, the same uh, rules uh, to say uh, yes, uh, the indicator is is well rated or no. Finally, there is another issue in the in the in the in the law uh, liber liberty of liberty of expression, for, for example. And finally, I wish to make a, a focus to illustrate, uh, to illustrate um, the difficulty to stop at the moment the, the study and the need of constant updating. That is another issue <laughs> with, the, the, uh, with the, the indicators. Uh, uh, because um, just now, since uh, May uh, 2023, there is a new law bill we, which aims to secure and regulate the numerical space uh, discussed. Uh, uh, loi, un projet de loi pour uh, sécuriser et réguler pardon, Internet. Um, it aims to prevent harassment, uh, hate speech, through uh, some new technical uh, measures, but uh, they are uh, also controversial. So uh, we we have the impression to 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 have look at everything in the uh, state of law and ah no a, a new bill of law. So it, it's very complicated to 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 write <laughs> a final draft <laughs> to communicate because uh, it's very um, fluctuant. Uh, in this uh, in this bill of law, um, there is some uh, measure of, uh, for uh, hosting providers, uh, which must remove child pornography in uh, um, within uh, 24 hours um, under penalty otherwise. But um, there is some subtleties, and uh, again, uh, if you just look at the uh, the the, um, the law you you can say yes yeah, there is law to protect child but again uh, there is law but uh, uh, what what are the consequences with, uh, and uh, <laughs> the, the the other indicator like uh, liberty of expression is uh, uh, un not uh, so <laughs> not so well rated uh, uh, du coup um, I it it was my my last word so <laughs> it's <laughs> perfect time um so uh thank you for for listening and uh, to have me here and um uh, just an I will quit the session uh um, prematurely because they, they lost my luggage in airport so I have to deal with that thank you <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Claire, uh, and thank you for giving this overview uh, and also illustrating the examples of uh, France. Um, I would like to next give the fl floor to our online participants, um, uh, speakers, uh, and uh, specifically to Pisal uh, Chanti, who has been leading the research in Cambodia. Uh, please, Pisal. Pisa will also address the question of 
Yes, uh, he will address the question um, around, around rights. Again, we don't uh, read out the question. He can. He will just uh, build uh, build it around uh, this theme. Please, Bissan. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you. Uh, first, I start by thanking uh, UNESCO for the invitation uh, for me to participate in this uh, forum. You hear me clearly, Lee, right? Yes, we do. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so I think I, I first start by giving introduction a little bit about the uh, IUI assessment in Cambodia. So IUI assessment in Cambodia is the initiative of the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication, which is the ministry responsible for digital technology and uh, telecommunication uh, in partnership with UNESCO Phnom Penh, uh, UNESCO in Cambodia, to initi initi initiate these projects. So uh, we kickstart the projects in uh, uh, 2022. However, there is a significant delays due to the gaps of data, but also some uh, issue that I uh, gonna present in the next session. So uh, before I start about uh, the problem we are uh, having in the uh, conducting the application of IUI assessment in Cambodia, especially, especially on the right category. So just to briefly uh, provide you in a background is that based on the finding of the right category uh, Cambodia in Cambodia our constitution have enshrined the fundamental human rights in the uh, text of the constitution and the royal government of Cambodia has ratified numerous of uh, regional and international human rights agreement thereby committed to uphold the rights both offline and online however there is no expression of legal regulation in Cambodia that define online and offline uh, equivalent of basic and human rights. Another issue is that uh, the interpretation of this commitment in practical have shown inconsistency. Defamation and insult uh, also into a type of cyber crime as well. Uh, it's committed via the computer network. Uh, another issue is on the legal uh, gap in the intermediary liability and uh, contents. Uh, while cyber a personal data protection law and cyber crime is being drafted. Uh, Computer-related offense were introduced for the time being in Cambodia Criminal Code in 2009 in Article uh, 317 and Article 3, uh, 320. The crime of infringement on uh, secrecy of correspondence and telecommunication and often in the information technology. Uh, legal framework for the lawful inception of data also defined in our telecom law in 2015 but claimed by the Human Rights Special Reporter as fake. And also there is a new introduction of the National Internet Gateway, uh, remain a uh, contentious between royal government of Cambodia and CSO in the country. And the implementation uh, uh, has been postponed without specific data. Uh, recently, the royal government of Cambodia has the, introduced the digital economy and society policy framework, which is a commitment of the government to transform the country to digital economy and society, but also introduce the Cambodia digital government policy uh, in early 2022, uh, aiming for a technological equipped and transparent government that foster an inclusive digital society, uh, emphasis on e-participation, which uh, this policy echo the UN e-government survey, focused on e-information, e-consultation, and e-decision making. So, uh, what is the, uh, uh, in short, uh, uh, the recommendation for this uh, human right uh, on the right aspect is that we are focusing on three aspects. If the first one is that the uh, different stakeholders, especially the government, uh, would focus on legal drafting and adoption. The uh, second aspect is on capacity building of the judiciary and relevant policy maker and stakeholder. And the last one is the encouragement on the multi-stakeholder participation of CSO development partner in the government. This is a brief summary of uh, the finding on the rights. So what is the uh, lesson learned and issue that we are conducting application of the IUI assessment in Cambodia, whereby I selected to uh, choose on the right matter. It doesn't mean that other category of the Rome X principle is not a problem. But right issue is a good lesson learned from us. So the issue is that rice, the matter of human rights, Cambodia in general is one of the contested front in Cambodia between the government and CSO. 
So even going without going deep into the digital uh, landscape, human rights has been a contested issue already. CSO quite uh, vocal in this field. Therefore, any matter related to rights uh, has been a uh, subjected to a lot of discussion and need to be careful. Uh, based on the uh, multi-stakeholder, the establishment of the multi-stakeholder advisory board, uh, we are trying to uh, create the uh, map uh, in a way that is representing CSO, government, everything, uh, even the academy, even the youth, uh, even the gender. However, there is still we need to be careful on the arrangement of the map. The second thing is the text itself, despite the finding. We need to ensure that all of the voice from the CSO, all of the voice from the government need to be incorporated. Otherwise, they would not agree in the text or in the validation. So we are planning to do the validation uh, uh, at the latest uh, at the end of this month or early next month. So the arrangement is also very careful, meaning that we need to prepare properly so to ensure that everyone take the ownership of it. It, it, it is a multi-stakeholder. So not only the government is separate, but also the CSO, but also development partner, but also the user of the internet. So what we have admitted that so far. So I think uh, it's important for the revise of the uh, uh, IUI assessment as well is that UNESCO in Cambodia has played a good moderator in this part. Because uh, from the government side, uh, they have the uh, firm position on the right aspects, while uh, from the CSO, they have a, a firm uh, stand on the uh, certain aspects of the uh, rise aspect as well. So what is UNESCO is doing is that the, based on their knowledge, based on their moderation, uh, they try to moderate the tax, but also moderate, ensure that, okay, this is the tax going to be accepted by the government, but also the CSO. So, uh, so what is the uh, strategy to be undertaken by UNESCO to improve uh, on this strategy is that uh, the UNESCO in respective country need to play a role, but a role as a moderator, a role that uh, the government accepted, but also the CSO. And the second thing is that uh, the responsible ministry, for example, in this, uh, Cambodia is Ministry of Post and Telecommunication. So the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication need to also take part to ensure that the recommendation recommended to the government is being addressed uh, and also entrusted, uh, uh, also entrusted the uh, research institution or consortium uh, to follow up the uh, recommendation have been done so far uh, to ensure that uh, uh, all the recommendation have been uh, in application by the stakeholder. So in short is that the multi hexal stakeholder approach is very crucial in the right aspects and UNESCO in respective country also play a role. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pisal. Um, uh, I'll next give the floor to Maria Fernanda Martinez from Argentina. Please, you have five floor. We're running a bit behind the schedule, so I'll uh, request the uh, speakers to please uh, remain within the slot. Five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiev. It's a pleasure for me to share this event with distinguished colleagues from around the world. I, I am the executive director and researcher of the Center for Technology and Society Studies in Argentina. CETIS is an academic and cross-disciplinary space for research, education, and communication of the policies and the development of digital processes in the public sphere. There are many things to discuss, so we will make an effort to share Argentina's most notable national findings related to rights, and also give our opinion regarding uh, what strategies UNESCO can undertake to improve local monitoring strategies. First, let me tell you that our report we adopt the strategy of the traffic light diagnosis. For each topic of each axis and according to the maturity level of the institutional path taken by Argentina, a color was identified, red, yellow, and green. We think it has been a good practice since it allows to have a quick approximation for each axis. Regarding to policy, legal, and rainwall framework, Argentina will have a general 
legal framework in keeping with international human rights standards. However, we are concerned about the expansion of the use of facial recognition technology and the increase in surveillance situations in social media. Besides, we have a legal framework that ensures freedom of expression. In terms of liability of intermediaries, there is no specific regulation and general principles of civil and criminal liability apply. There are relevant judicial proceedings tending to not apply objective liability and non-compulsory use of monitoring mechanisms in online context. The right to access to information is recognized and the agenda for the matter seems to have reached the same state uh, policy status, at least in the wording of the regulation. Transparency in actions is not verified in the same way in all different contexts and levels of the state. Regarding freedom of association and right to participate in management of public affairs, legal framework that favors freedom of association online. However, that right may be affected by use, affordability and access inequality. Related to the right to privacy, here we have an outdated legal framework for, the, for data protection. At subnational level, growing use of biometric data for security related activities were opacity in the norm. We observe little transparency and interruptions in national intelligence and data interception policies. What strategy UNESCO can undertake to improve local monitoring strategies? First of all, we believe that it is very important to have a realistic work preparation outline and schedule that includes monitoring instance for example, short progress report or participation or reports on meeting with the map. For the application of the recommendation, uh, we think that institutional characteristics are, characteristics are very important. We know that UNESCO take this into account, but it is necessary to reinforce its importance because it is fundamental that the organization that carry out the research has a history and links with all actors in the ecosystem. It is also fundamental to have a balanced composition in terms of sector and gender of the map. UNESCO has to encourage the research team to have a conscious recommend, consensus recommendations with the map. In our case, in each axis, we establish objectives and recommendations by sector that were debated and then agreed upon with the, the, with the members of the map. This guarantees its relevance and also its viability. Identify those recommendations where they can have the greatest impact. It is important to recognize which are those where, due to the characteristics of the team, institution, and contextual needs, greater impact can be achieved. Then, generate space for dialogue and action to advance the implementation of the recommendations. In our case, for example, we have identified the issue of protection of personal data as crucial. So we organized several meetings with relevant actors to discuss modification to the current bill that culminate in holding specific conference on the draft law on protection of personal data. Another important issue is the publication deadlines for local reports. We are aware that there are many internal and necessary validations instance and we also know that UNESCO is trying to accelerate them, and we appreciate it, since the delay in publications make it lose relevance. Um, well, regarding to this point, we think that at the time of the forming of the team, one of the researchers could be designed the designated... Fernanda, you have... Sorry, you have one minute to wrap up, please. Yes, it's, it, it's a last, my last word. Yeah, thank um, you. Yes, regarding to this point, we think that at the time of forming the team, one of the researchers could be designated to continue working with UNESCO through the period between the delivery of the final document and its publication. Well, thank you very much. And before closing, I want to name all the team, Lex Bustofrati, Carolina Cairo, Ivan Fishman, and Delfina Ferracuti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Um, thank you for also your suggestions. Uh, the next one uh, in my list is uh, Grace uh, Githaiga from Kenya. Uh, please, Grace, the floor is yours. Five minutes, please. Uh, 
I think uh, uh, I want to be very brief. When we looked at the rights, and this is our first review because we did the we did the we did the first uh, report and released it in 2022. Then we reviewed after two years. Uh, the result is that uh, in terms of rights, uh, Kenya has a comprehensive policy, legal and institutional framework for human rights, uh, which adapts international human rights standards for, among others, freedom of expression, freedom of access to information, freedom of association, the right to participate in the conduct of public affairs, the right to privacy, and social and economic and cultural rights. And while there is no legislation blocking our internet access, there are legal restrictions on human rights and challenges in the enforcement and practical implementation of the laws. Um, and for example, uh, we held a general election in August 2022, and then the COVID-19 pandemic, these two exposed gaps in internet freedom, uh, such as threats, um, uh, of, of incidents of abuse, of repressive laws, and cases of disinformation uh, were on the increase. Uh, there is also limited focus by key actors to systematically monitor the state of human rights, particularly with respect to the digital uh, environment. Also, there is uh, you know, awareness uh, across key sectors of digital rights and of private sector, on the UN, there's lack of uh, awareness across key sectors of digital rights and of private sector on the UN guiding principles, for example, on business and human rights, which remains a key concern. And I want to end there. Thank you very much, Grace, uh, for sharing your experience. And really, Kenya is a great example o o for us, uh, both being one of the countries to implement the framework and also um, uh, to implement the first uh, follow-up. Uh, I will I will give the floor to an online participant, fr uh, first speaker, first, uh, Santosh. Uh, so I invite Swaran. Uh, uh, to take the floor, Swaran uh, Ravindra, who, who who is based in Fiji but coordinating uh, the assessments in uh, three islands in the Pacific. Please, uh, Swaran. Um, thank you, Tadevik. Bulabinaka, uh, Malolele, Talofa. My name is Swaran Ravindra. I work as uh, an academic at Fiji National University, and I have also been commissioned by uh, UNESCO to uh, as, as a lead researcher for the Romex project, um, which is well, my, under my responsibility comes Fiji, Tuvalu, and Solomon Islands. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So um, I will um, not take too much of time. I will just go directly into the question that I have uh, been uh, asked to speak about. So um, my category was openness. And uh, before I go into um, the, the, some of the strategies that uh, we have uh, you know, come up with, I just wanted to uh, let the audience know that uh, for us, this is still work in progress. The project is only one month old so far, or one month young so far. So we're still navigating through the, the various aspects of the project. And um, so everything that uh, the, the other participants or the other uh, researchers are talking about, it, it, it heavily resonates with our work in the Pacific at the moment. Um, I also have some uh, uh, people in, in the room today, Kyoto, unfortunately, I could not be there, but uh, we have uh, uh, Chena Noya, who is Director of tele Telecommunications from Tuvalu. So I'm happy to have interventions um, at the end. Um, so the question precisely that was asked to me was, what strategies can be used to overcome data unavailability and obtain high quality and, 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 and updated data? Now, this is something that is no, no news in the Pacific. You know, uh, We have been uh, you know, information rich and uh, knowledge poor in some cases. And at the same time, we have seen that there are areas of serious data gaps um, both in government institutions and also in uh, you know many different areas where we we need to access citizen centric services right so some of um, the the strategies that uh, my team, my team came up with is um, to regularly update information for citizen centric services uh, we also need support from global organizations so just give me one moment Your mute is foreign. Uh, apologies. Yes, so um, 
um, we we noted that it is very important for us to have support from global organizations. So we, we uh, thoroughly thank UNESCO for um, you know faith in the project and also um, at, uh, in under understanding the predicaments that are Pacific centric, right? Uh, and as as the other speakers were talking about the different experiences, uh, and we we as a team, uh, those working in the Pacific for Romex uh, project, we have seen that some of them resonate with us, and and then some of them are so uh, centric to the Pacific, right? Um, so one particular project that I wanted to share with you, which is, in fact, it could be taken as a strategy. Um, it, the last two years, uh, I have been involved in UNDP's uh, Right to Information project, and uh, I have realized that many things that are asked under openness, um, if we already have Right to Information project deployed by UNDP in those economies, it makes it much easier to answer the questions uh, under the indicators. Uh, of course, there are still lots of gaps, but the fact that uh, right to information project was deplo deployed prior to um, our Romex project, it, it really helped in getting some of the information. Um, also reports from ITU, UN and scholarly articles, but I found uh, the right to information project information, information from the right to, uh, right to information project, as well as ITU and UN reports more helpful. Um, we also spoke about, uh, you know, the need for having a research team or uh, a special consultants a team of special consultants that could form a national body of researchers to work with, you know, to, to, to be able to work in ethical standards uh, in terms of data collection. Now, this is something that could be embedded within uh, Bureau of Statistics uh, in Fiji. Um, uh, there was another research project that I did where it was very difficult to get information. And that information came much, much later, about two, about two years later. So if there would be a special body of researchers who could support uh, the data collection processes it's also uh, quite evident that many people who are doing research may not necessarily be research centric people, but they are there at ground level and uh, you know, they're, they're there to help and they have access to the, the most uh, important and even the most vulnerable communities where we need to get data from. Um, the, the need for support of uh, the government particularly is, is really, really important, especially in the le lesser developed economies. Also the need for benchmarking. Now, as uh, the other speakers were talking about their experiences, I could, uh, in fact, uh, uh, start thinking about different types of avenues where we can get some, you know, good benchmarking practices so that we can learn and, and see what, what, what part of it can we adapt in the Pacific. Of course, awareness. Um, recently, I had an informal meeting. Our map has not been uh, formalized yet. We have been in the process of uh, talking to different stakeholders and uh, just to, because in the Pacific, we have a very different style of working. Uh, what, what we call Talanoa in Fiji, which means casual conversation. This is where we build relationships in the community. And it is it is uh, one of the most um, important, one of the most, uh, uh, it could be both formal and casual, but it is also one of the best sources of information and in uh, in, in terms of um, creating partnership with, uh, with the stakeholders. So we have Ministry of Communication. We also have Ministry of Education. We have the support of the permanent secretaries. We have also um, Pacific Disability Forum. Um, and, and there's a number of other, if I had more time, I would have been able to deliberate on that. Uh, we have a number of different um, representation from the, the various stakeholders in, in Fiji who have been willing to support us. But if we did have a lot of information on the website, then it would have been much, much more helpful. Um, in saying that, many things that come under openness uh, is regulated could you by... Please uh, start wrapping up, please. Sorry? Could you start Not wrapping okay, up, sure. please? Okay, so we have uh, some uh, predicaments, for example, the uh, the difference between uh, the Information Act and the Right to Information Act. In some of the Pacific Islands, uh, they are embedded into one. And then in some of the Pacific Islands, we don't have uh, the Privacy Act at all. We also have Human Rights Commission, we have Online Safety Commission, we also have the Cyber Crimes Act. However, deployment is, is, is questionable. But if I were to just, you know, make one broad statement about the need for multi-stakeholderism, that is very, very important. Um, however, in the Pacific, we have a very civic centric style to that. However, there's one more thing that I wanted to iterate on before um, I finish off. If we have uh, an, a prior assessment on right to information, I think that would be really uh, helpful in addressing the questions under openness. That is all from me. Um, you're most welcome to uh, co contact me on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to work with you and you know learn more from each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Swaran, for driving the work forward um, in all these uh, countries and for sharing the experience. And I would like now to give the floor to Santos Sigdele from Nepal. Please, you have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Tatebik. 
Hello everyone here and online. I'm Santosh Sigdal from Nepal. I'm Executive Director of Digital Rights Nepal and co-convener of uh, Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principle. Uh, Digital Rights Nepal implemented the national assessment in Nepal and based on our experience, I'll be sharing something on the question, how could we improve the process of establishing consultation and validation of the finding with the multi-stakeholder advisory board? So my presentation will be limited on that. And I have only five minutes, four minutes, 30 seconds, so I'll be very quick. <laughs> Uh, Multi-stakeholder uh, advisory board, as, as said earlier by Fabio, is the first uh, step of the national assessment. However, this is not mandatory within the uh, uh, UNESCO framework. That is strongly recommended, but not, uh, uh, not mandatory. And the, uh, the member of the, this group includes uh, uh, the uh, government, the private sector, technical community, academics, civil society, and others. However, uh, if we look at the process, especially because we established, the, we implemented the process in Nepal. In the in the context of Nepal, it was largely dominated by the government agencies and the regulator, including the representation of uh, UNESCO. And we were invited as an observer uh, uh, while we did the research. So it is very important, based on our experience, it is very important that uh, we make the we preach the multi-stakeholderism, but while framing the multi-stakeholder advisory board, it seems that we have forgotten the concept of multi-stakeholderism. That is very important to ensure. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, the stakeholders feel that at, at times they do not know about the process and uh, they do not see the importance. So establish the importance of this whole uh, national assessment process. It is important to bring all the necessary stakeholder in the process. And uh, about the role of the multi-stakeholder advisory board, they have advising role, they, they call the meeting, they help in peer review, and based on the experience of Nepal, uh, in Nepal, uh, from the very, very beginning, um, MMB was very, MAP was very uh, involved. They identified the group, stakeholder group, they identified, they f uh, supported in finalizing the uh, questionnaire, identifying the data sources. At the same time, they provided inputs and they also provided in the draft report. They actually identified the location, the geography, location, stakeholder group and everything. Uh, however, we see, as a takeaway, we see that uh, uh, there is a there is a kind of balance we need to make. If the government is not involved in the process, it is very it is not easy to get the data uh, because uh, this report is uh, based on the availability of the formal official reports and data. And at times, if the process is somehow dominated by the government and regulator, there is a possibility of whitewashing the internet scenario and presenting a rosy picture, and the report will be kind of tool for, for, uh, for the time being to give a picture of the internet situation in the country. So there is a kind of balance uh, we have, we need to ensure. And uh, uh, in that process, if we, from the experience of Nepal, we see that uh, at one point we also, the MAB also organized an inter-ministerial meeting inviting all the ministries and their representative in the draft report. And we see that a very important aspect because tomorrow, uh, the importance of report is on its implementation. If there is only the report for, uh, for the uh, sake of publication, uh, it's not important. But if we want to implement the report tomorrow, it is important to have the buy-in from all the government agencies, important government agencies, because tomorrow, Ministry of Education or Ministry of Health is going to implement the report. So they, if they are in the process, it is important that uh, they are in the uh, not at the last point at the validation workshop, but they are somehow engaged from the beginning of the report. So that is very important. And uh, on, we already discussed about the non-availability of the disaggregated data is, uh, in, uh, across, the, uh, across the board, but uh, it is more important 
at the, uh, in the least developed countries like Nepal. And one suggestion uh, is that while talking about the multi-stakeholder, uh, strengthening the multi-stakeholderism or the, the MAP process, it, uh, in our opinion, it is also important to include the national census of which there are any. Because if they are collecting the national census, they will know what are the important indicator, the critical indicator, and they might include those indicators while collecting the census. And tomorrow, we have the relevant data while reporting it. So I remain here. Thank you. Thank you for the time. And if there are any questions or comments, I'll be here throughout the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Santosh. Uh, and uh, before we break uh, for coffee, where we would uh, have more time to speak uh, with the speakers, I would like to give the floor to Anna um, Amumu David. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing. From Namibia, please, the, the floor is yours. All right. Um, Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Anna Momo David from Namibia, and I will be presenting briefly about openness as well. Um, I just want to state here that um, throughout, s although Namibia is still in progress with the um, assessment, um, one of the pivotal roles that the multi-stakeholder -stake advisory board have done for us to be able to carry this out was primarily because they would then help us to address the various indicators as they come in that would be relevant to not only a particu particular category, but at the same time a particular um, indicator or, or guiding question within that particular indicator. Now, when it comes to openness in Namibia, one of the things that we initially looked for was things such as open source and um, open source softwares, and then also realizing that there was no um, di direct legal framework pertaining to the internet that enabled um, consumer protection in terms of the open data as well that would come with the open internet. Additionally, we looked at things like um, the different licensing um, softwares um, and how government would then prioritize considering um, the national priority for cybersecurity, for an example, um, on how exactly the openness parts of um, the, the, the various indicators would come in. And then um, what we are busy finding, establishing right now is that in terms of licensing, um, the openness of the internet is actually broken down further into sector-specific um, regulation. So as much as there is these um, indicators, they are however potentially um, limiting to that particular sector in terms of re um, relevance as well as encouraging a broader um, innovation um, promotion. So um, part of these indicators also prompted that the regulation um, within the openness category, there were some indication that the regulation would ensure that everybody who would then in s in, in not only um, es establish themselves with as an entrepreneur, for an example, um, coming up with a web business or a, a, a digital e-commerce um, platform would then have to go through um, a, a sector-specific guided guideline opposed to a um, internet standard, for instance, ISO 27001, um, that would then be implemented by the National Statistics, um, I mean, s um, Standards Institute. So um, this also became relevant to say that um, the openness of the internet coincided um, with the current um, access to information bill that was enacted in parliament just last year, which allows for the proactive disclosure um, of information. And this plays a role because at the end of the day, when there is openness to a particular um, institution when it comes to digital or internet um, accessibility, it also means that their platforms would be proactively put online, but then 
it also calls for um, this data to be put in a language or in a format that is accessible to an individual which further um, takes it away from the human rights aspects because there are certain um, disabilities that cannot be catered for within the online space. And then um, the within the Namibian space as well, there is no direct potential for um, people with disabilities to be included. So that openness aspect is also a little bit hampered. Um, and then um, one one of the major stakeholders that we actually look working with is the Office of the Prime Minister, which is the custodian um, of our ICT sector uh, um, in terms of regulation as well as um, policy. So um, in, in collaboration with the Ministry of ICT, of course, and the Ministry of um, Higher Education, which is responsible for training and capacity building for the various individuals of age this would then comes to a point where the openness aspects are further um, in enriched, although um, we're building capacity towards them. Right. Um, yes, I will still be around and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and I would like to thank all the all the speakers online and here in the room. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your excellent contributions and for sharing uh, not only um, your uh, input f f as we move forward with the re uh, revision, but also reflecting on the national context, which, uh, which is uh, really valuable. Um, and um, we would now go for a very short uh, coffee break. I know that uh, in the schedule, uh, based on the scenario, we have Q&A, but uh, given that uh, the participants in the room will hopefully stay for the second part of the session as well, I invite you all to speak with our experts, uh, with, uh, with the panelists uh, around the coffee. And I apologize to all nine um, uh, uh, participants, but we will take your questions uh, after the break. Uh, we'll be back just in 10 minutes. If we can be here at uh, 5.45 local time uh, in 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we will now resume the session. So just to check um, if online speakers are back, Ariuzul, Sadaf. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Ari, it's Ariuzul. Thank you, Sadaf and Matthias and Asrat and Alan and Iklika. Yes. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask the online moderator, my colleague Karen, as I promised, we will start with the online questions. Are there any online questions or online comments to be addressed, Karen? Um, there was a few uh, elements that were talked about in the, in the comments. Um, you, yes, can you please read them out to so ensure that yes. we have participation and inputs from the online speakers as participants as well? Thank yes. Uh, so uh, Sadaf was saying, uh, wait. So Sadaf was saying, as a researcher, as a researcher based in a civil society institution, it is interesting for me to see that. Uh, government organization leading the research have also struggled with finding the sweet spot where the CSOs and government can agree. There is also uh, one where she talks about uh, digital authoritarianism uh, in uh, her country and the pressure to reflect the government perspective and position uh, which um, has been intense in our experience. Um, there is also, Sadaf is also talking about uh, the multi-stakeholder and validation process um, that should involve the government, but that has been challenging on her part. So there is that, uh, which Sadaf is representing uh, Pakistan. So this is her, pers her perspective on such uh, issues. 
There is also um, uh, Swaran who was talking about the, the whitewashing of the um, uh, in the research and see, see it as a, a difficulty and a challenge to overcome. And um, also she said that there is a mutual purpose uh, under, that needs to be understood between the, the stakeholders and the government. So this is also something that we, we can discuss uh, in a few. And um, Sergio Martinez, uh, who was uh, participating online, um, said, uh, he had a question which said, in countries like Namibia seeking to develop sectoral specific regulations to support specific segments such as e-commerce, digital business, and people with disability, disabilities, which sources, guideline, or standards offer a starting point to account for country-specific needs when there are gaps in the underlying global frameworks? So this is kind of the only question we have uh, in the chat for now. So if you have any input, we can uh, discuss it now or discuss it in the next uh, Q&A segment. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Karen, my colleague um, uh, working with us on Romex project. Um, Anna, would you like to take the question on Namibia? Karen, can you please repeat the last question for Namibia? So uh, the question is, um, which sources, guidelines or standards uh, offer a starting point to account for a country's specific needs when there are gaps in the underlying global frameworks? Okay. All right. Um, I think what worked best in Namibia is because um, prior to us being able to actually carry out the Rome X, we have done a couple of research of our own, um, basic research, um, and engaged in a number of projects. And then also what we have done is with the government, um, because the Internet Society um, is the one conducting the research, we had established ourselves to be a partner um, in, and have our foot in the door with the various ministries, such as the Ministry of ICT, as well as um, other institutions. And then um, this paved the way for us to be able to actually engage directly with them, particularly to we, when it came to the to the Romex exercise. In addition to that, I believe that um, initially when we started, we started off with the multi-stakeholder advisory board where we had invited a lot of um, the different ministries, government agencies, as well as offices we felt that are key um, stakeholders and should we then reach out to them a second or a third time whenever we had an intervention this um, made it possible the only thing is that um, the global standards do not necessarily set the tone for the Namibian standards because with the Namibian standards there are no there are no standards first of all we use the ISO 27001 um, and um, the office responsible for maintaining the standards at this point um, simply adopts them. So what we engage, how we engage with that is basically putting uh, measures in place where we examine our standards ourselves and if they're not relevant, then we rather advise that they're not relevant to us because of various um, reasons pertaining to whether the indicator speaks to us or not. I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so if there are no uh, other questions uh, from the previous part of the discussions uh, discussion, I will now pass um, to the second part of the discussion, which will be focusing on accessibility category and multi-stakeholder participation, as well as cross-cutting uh, category of the framework. Um, as I mentioned previously, we we have a set of questions which we asked um, 
the uh, which we ask the uh, speakers to focus on, but of course not limiting the uh, the discussion around the, the specific question, but to make sure all the topics are covered. And with uh, with this, I would like to now. Um, uh, give the floor to online participants. Uh, Aryuzul Ochir from Mongolia, who is the lead researcher from Mongolia, followed by Sadaf Khan uh, from Pakistan. Aryuzul, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tevnik, and I believe uh, you can hear me and see me well. Very, very well, glad to thank be. You. Thank you. I'm very glad to be a part of the IUI community across the world. And my name is Erin Zoll, lead researcher, and I'm leading researcher of the Mongolian IUI assessment. Uh, I just want to clarify the views presented today are based on my professional uh, insights driven from the Mongolian IUI assessment conducted last year. And if I summarize the key findings of the accessibility team in Mongolian assessment, in one sentence, I would say, Although the internet is relatively affordable and accessible for uh, general public, it's not accessible for persons with disabilities, uh, language minorities, and old people as well. So uh, I believe that accessibility is a precondition of the inclus inclusion in both digital and uh, um, uh, physical world. Uh, so therefore, to enhance the current assessment comprehensiveness, uh, I would like to propose a revision or reorganization of the questions in accessibility sections, and particularly the uh, current question uh, AD 6.1, which asks like existence of legal and regulatory provisions to promote access and use of internet by the persons with disabilities in Mongolia. Because uh, for example, in Mongolia, we have a website standard known as MNS uh, 62 Eight five uh, two thousand seventeen outlining requirements uh, for government websites. However, this standard fall uh, short in adequately addressing the barriers faced by the persons with disabilities because there are no requirements for to ensure uh, the use of the assistive technologies and uh, softwares and devices by the persons with disabilities. No requirements to ensure the uh, adjustment for the color blindness and no requirements for adjusting the websites for especially persons with the photosensitive uh, scissors and so on. And when using the web uh, content accessibility guideline, which is developed by the web uh, World Web Consortium back in 2008, none of the, uh, the government website in Mongolia uh, fully comply with the with these guidelines. Therefore, I felt that uh, the current question may blur the original intention of uh, intention of you know the ensuring the web accessibility for persons with disability, not necessarily limited by the persons with disability. Also, again, uh, language minority and old people and people who are temporarily you know the injured uh, uh, injured. So uh, that's why because uh, every country uh, obviously has their own standard uh, to to ensure the web accessibility, but unfortunately some of them are not fully addressing the barriers uh, faced by the persons with the disability. So I specifically recommend to incorporating in inquiries about whether the country adheres to web content accessibility guideline by World Web Consortium or something similar, because the web content accessibility guideline is the world globally recognized and used web accessibility guideline, which plays really crucial uh, roles in many countries, including the US. I know in US, uh, they are following the web content accessibility guideline under the section 508 in the EU country also, they have similar web accessibility guideline uh, called EN301549, uh, which uh, a majority of the requirements are aligned with the web uh, accessibility uh, guideline uh, and, uh, guidance. So, so briefly sum up, um, uh, I see that AIU has the two main benefits to our country. First, encouraging governments to ensure the human rights issue in digital environment. And second, uh, educating stakeholders what to do and next in order to ensure the human rights in digital world. So therefore, 
since there's a good, you know, the best practices, uh, which is uh, web content accessibility, why don't we include this guideline in existing questions? So that's the one insight that I want to share with you today. And thank you. Over to you, Tetevik. <laughs> thank you very much, Aryazul. Thank you for presenting uh, the case. And um, actually, Mongolia is... Um, uh, has successfully finalized the report and validated, and we look forward to its publication, which is now uh, under underway. The process is underway is uh, in UNESCO. Uh, so the next uh, on my list is Sadaf, uh, who is leading the research in Pakistan. Please, Sadaf, the floor is yours. And just a, uh, a reminder that um, I am not uh, giving a presentation of the speaker, so if you want to uh, present yourself, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Sada. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to try and keep um, my intervention to three short points. Um, I'm Sadaf, I'm the lead researcher of the assessment in Pakistan. Um, the Pakistan assessment is also complete and in the process of review for publication at the moment. Um, so for the for the three categories, the multi-stakeholderism, accessibility, etc., I'm giving I'm making three um cross-cutting points that I felt have potential um, to be reviewed as UNESCO undergoes the process of revising the Internet Universality Indicators Framework. The first thing that I would like to talk about is the um, challenges that are linked to contextual analysis. And speakers before me have also pointed out some of the challenges that they had faced. And I think it's okay to, like, and on the on onset, it is obviously going to be very challenging to apply a contextual analysis to a framework that is global. Um, I think one of the things that came to me again and again as I was undergoing through the process of assessment, I think these challenges themselves also present an opportunity to start looking at the framework um, in a way that allows UNESCO and other global players to, to, you know, basically review how they are reviewing and assessing some of the things. There was a question in the chat earlier about whitewashing, and this comment also kind of links to that. I'll give you a very specific example. One of the core elements that is indicative of mobile gender gap, um, and also included as a part of accessibility um, framework, is the mobile and SIM phone ownership. Now, Pakistan has one of the largest, highest mobile gender gaps in the whole world. But we know that in Pakistan, at least, ownership is not really an accurate indicator of usage. Here, SIM access is linked to biometric validation. We also are a conservative society. We are also a society where safety for women generally is a challenge. So what happens when biometric is linked to SIM validation is that various women, including those who are actually using the internet, who live in urban centers um, and are seen are generally like from progressive um, communities, et cetera, they, even they do not prefer to own their own SIM. They will send the men in the family to get the SIM, um, you know, to get the myometric verification done. And it doesn't mean that they're not using it. The purpose is simply to ensure that your gender doesn't become a reason for the shopkeeper, whoever is doing the validation, to start messaging and harassing you. Um, so again, because ownership is consistently seen, whether it's the GSMA framework, whether it's the Rome indicators, something that's seen as a very fundamental part of how you assess mobile gender access, I think this kind of gives an opportunity to start looking at how we are assessing and, and making sure that the assessment framework, it also reflects the realities of global South, the realities of countries where there is digital authoritarianism and tribalism, conservatism within the society. And my recommendation for this specifically um, is not to do with the framework itself, but within the methodology guidelines, which inform how researchers frame the research, right? Frame their recommendations. I think it would be interesting to explore the possibility to include an annex where the research team can actually document how these intersections took place, which of the indicators um, 
came out to or appeared to be indicators that that had a whitewashing or a very universal approach um and that allows later to also have a more in-depth debate so maybe perhaps not directly a part of the framework but as an annex that allows the structured commentary on how um the rome framework has intersected with the realities in different countries the second um, point that I want to make is about the reputations within the indicators framework. There are obviously some obvious reputations which are also highlighted and when indicators appear in different categories, you, have, you see those listed. But then there are other reputations that are highlighted only when you are um, analyzing the findings. Um, and there are obviously intersections specifically, let's say you're talking about subscription data, disaggregated data that relates to subscription. And then um, most specifically, there are the cross-cutting indicators. Now the category X, it's cross-cutting and we already know from its framing that it's cross-cutting. However, um, after the completion of the research, right? If I look at how cross-cutting the actual analysis was, there, there, um, I think there are some obvious gaps that come into play. Gender, for example, is something that across, like which not just in Pakistan, but other researches, uh, researches that I've also gone through, gender informs analysis in a, in a specific way. But children who are a part of the cross-cutting category, they do not appear anywhere else. So my recommendation, again, because this is a comprehensive framework, would perhaps be to explore if there is a possible way to redraft the elements included in category X as an analytical framework rather than a separate category. So rather it being a separate category of assessment, it actually becomes a cross-cutting lens for analysis that allow those elements to be reflected more comprehensively um, within the analytical framework. Thank you. Thank um, you, Sadaf. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadaf, uh, for your suggestions and your input. I will now give the floor to Eduardo. Eduardo Carillo, uh, from, who, who is the lead researcher for Paraguay. Please, Eduardo, the floor is yours. Five minutes, please. I'll try to be also as brief as, as brief as possible. Thank you very much. And perhaps even keep it a bit shorter uh, to give other panelists uh, more time to speak also. So we were asked to do a presentation on how the findings in our country in a specific category went. So I'm gonna be very brief on the accessibility part. And just to say that although we can affirm or the the research that we did for the Romex for the 2018 and 2022 period, uh, gave us the affirmation that we had an 11% growth of internet users in Paraguay. We still have a number of scenarios that uh, show a lot of challenges, specifically around high connection speeds and zero rating plans that still exist and offer an uneven, an uneven free access to certain social media platforms. And thus they contribute to an unequal access to the internet and, infor and information access in general. And, and also very similarly to what some of uh, my colleagues have been presenting so far, we still need to improve gender uh, equality or an approach of gender equality in internet access. Specifically, when we were doing the research, we had a lot of problem uh, finding gender disaggregated data on internet access. Uh, and, and this should be mainstream in, in national service to support the development of, of targeted gender policy responses. Uh, on this matter. And connecting this to the issue of, of, of service, I would also say that we encounter a number of differences in the actual connectivity uh, percentages in the country because the two agencies, the ICT agencies and the national statistic agency that are in charge of developing this kind of instruments have different methodologies that in a way show a diff different numbers on how connected the country is and this is a problem these agencies should speak more closely in order to present uh, a more unified number if, if that's the case uh, and lastly but not least we are a country that is quite unique in the world because we have two official languages uh, the Spanish language and the Guarani indigenous language. And that means that the state is bound to ensure that both languages are available in websites and in general services, general public services in general. But this doesn't happen both in the offline and also in the online world. Although we have, or we now have regulation that obliges the states to have their websites in both languages, this is not the case and is something that uh, definitely needs a revision. And 
in terms of the question that we were posed that, that we had to to answer in mind was about you know how we can overcome that un unavailability and obtain uh, high quality and updated data within the the, the Romex uh, process of data collection and then feeding that data collection or, or that collected da data in the indicators. Uh, I think that when thinking more broadly about the Romex and its future application, different realities should be considered concerning data availability and what is the understanding of data availability in certain contexts. Specifically in the Paraguayan context and for the research that we conducted, we partner from the get-go with government to ensure fast and uh, detailed access to information replies, as well as ensuring private meetings with public officials that were able to give us the information that was needed. So that definitely is an interesting strategy that I know a lot of my colleagues have uh, done in the past or have also adopted to, to, to access to the necessary information. There are a lot of indicators, even the short one is 106, so you need a lot of information to, 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 to fill those indicators. And also in our case, the help of certain MAP members was quite crucial to access information that perhaps if they were in there was going to be a bit more difficult to, to map in the data collection state. And this said, and I'm gonna quote Fabio on the flexibility of the methodology, that he was mentioning before. I think that in the context of Paraguay, regardless of all the strategies that you can adopt, there is a general lack of data availability. Like the government doesn't have the capacity to produce data in a evidence-based way or in a structure, structure methodological way. So in example, we had some indicators around indigenous community or even children uh, c communities, or even children's connectivity details that were non-existent in a way that could allow us to affirm that they were like updated information that could reflect the reality of the country for the years that we were uh, looking at. But in a context of lack of data availability, any information that we found, even if it's like five years, uh, f like let's say like we did the research in 2018 and the data that we found was from 2000 and 15 or 13 or so, uh, we think that should be accepted, at least for the first editions of the Rome X uh, in the countries that hopefully will continue conducting this re research. Because in the end, the Rome X report should be like the centralized place where all information regarding ICT is logged, at least on the first edition. And then we can see in subsequent editions if it's worth continue putting the same information or in those cases, perhaps it's more easy to affirm that there isn't any data on a specific topic and that that's that information should be uh, produced. So I'm seeing that I'm 40 seconds past my time, but those will be my two cents on uh, this. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo, and thank you for the timing as well. Um, I, um, I know Simon would have something to say about the data, so I will not, uh, it, it was uh, data availability something that many speakers um, uh, touched upon, so I'll leave it to Simon. Uh, but now I would like to give the floor to Matthias uh, Ketemann, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, from uh, Germany, uh, followed by Asrat Mulato from Ethiopia. Please, Matthias, the floor is yours. Hello, hi. I'm very sorry that I can't do video, but uh, it's in the middle of the, <laughs> the afternoon and I'm with my family. But I'm more than happy to talk a bit about our experiences in Germany. Now, uh, let me focus on the importance of multi-stakeholderism. So, at the very outset, we made sure to include all relevant stakeholders in the process of uh, developing uh, our assessment uh, uh, under the uh, IUIs. Uh, what we did from the outset was to consult as broadly as possible, as many stakeholder groups as possible. Uh, on the one hand, we included them in our sounding board, that is to say our advisory uh, board, but we also, in addition to that, uh, talked with as many people we could, from scholars to scientists to administrators to legislators, to make sure that uh, the concerns they had were reflected in our studies and in the assessment that we were developing. Now, I realize that the uh, importance of multi-stakeholderism is, is, is broadly accepted, but the reality is that 
um, a lot of multi-stakeholder exercises don't actually work so well because you only um, you know, select a, a token number of people or you lack in diversity. So you have to be really keenly aware of the importance of making multi-stakeholderism work in light of the goals you have in mind. So what we did was at the very outset um, separate the categories of indicators we wanted to uh, work on and uh, selected a person as a sort of a, a consultant to advise us which um, stakeholders to, to talk to in order to make sure that all representative uh, groups were in fact uh, you know, represented in the, in the process of developing the indicators. Then after we had uh, written our pieces, after we had collected the data, um, we then went into a multi-stakeholder based review phase. What we did then was to share our output, share the parts of the um, study we were already comfortable with sharing with a very large number of um, societal stakeholders and asked them for their input and asked them whether the uh, research we had conducted reflected their, um, their impression of the topic, whether we they felt we had selected and studied all the necessary data, whether they felt we had missed something big. And based on that, we then refined our report. And then in the last step, we had a big meeting with all the representatives in our sounding board. We asked uh, for each topic, we asked a, uh, a member of the board to act sort of as a, as a, as a devil's advocate, to advocate what we missed, what we didn't include. And we were then able to defend or uh, include uh, revisions into our papers. Uh, globally, multi-stakeholderism is on the rise, but we feel that an exercise like the IOIs is so important as an example of how multi-stakeholderism can work in practice. Uh, and we are very happy with the outcome, and I'm more than happy to uh, be here for any questions, either in written or right now. Sorry for the uh, unusual format of presenting. Take care and see you soon. Thank you so much, Matthias, for, for sharing your thoughts um, and, you, uh, and presenting the case in Germany. And we do realize that this is a Sunday uh, uh, session and uh, we do appreciate that uh, all of you here and also uh, back online at uh, your homes took the time uh, to, to share your uh, thoughts. We appreciate that very much. Uh, so next one in my uh, agenda is Asrat, uh, but I was notified that he's not online. Uh, he's not connected. Asrat, can you, are you there? Uh, Karen, uh, is Asrat still not there? No, okay. no, no, he's no, not connected. Okay, then we will uh, move to the next speaker, um, and if he joins, he can contribute later on. Iglika Ivanova from Bulgaria. Iglika, please. Thank you so much. I will now go to share my slides. Would you please confirm if they're loaded? I cannot see yes. it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, contribute to this very insightful, very informative uh, discussion. Uh, as you can see, um, just a second to gain back control to my slides. Um, I will present the conduction of national assessment on internet development in Bulgaria for the very first time. Uh, it's ongoing national evaluation. It is one among the three European countries now with ongoing Romex indicators uh, assessment. Uh, we focused uh, on this presentation on, um, on um, uh, the collaboration we, we have with uh, UNESCO and the advisors on multi-stakeholder participation. Um, just a very uh, uh, quick um, overview of what we are doing in the Ministry of Electronic Governance I'm representing now and the department. We focus on uh, the policy and digital transformation in the field of innovative technology, digital rights and principles. We focus on digital democracy and policies for internet governance in the domains. 
And if I'm mentioning that, even if you'll have the slides later, is because of this idea of how we um, identify the neighboring fields and intersections with other frameworks uh, and instruments as uh, Global Digital Compact in this case, in this case, uh, with the Digital Decade Policy Program of the European Union, uh, which is now the focus of uh, our uh, work uh, in this uh, governmental um, uh, two years program. Um, and here are some of the important findings. I would say you will, for yourself, uh, uh, get a conclusion how these two are connected. Uh, here are some recommendations for Bulgaria. There is a scope to improve performance in digital transition. An even distribution of digital infrastructure in rural areas requires further attention. Um, in particular, we need to minimize the administrative burden placed on companies and significant efforts should be made in the promotion of digital skills. Um, here is how we are implementing the project. You can see the, the framework 2022 uh, 2020 to 2024. Uh, it is part among the four measures implemented by the Ministry of Governance uh, in National Action Plan. Uh, that is part of Open Government Partnership Initiative. Uh, it is thematic areas, transparency and access to information. You can see how it resonates with the philosophy and the goals of the Romex. Uh, it is again about um, all we do, it is about multi-stakeholder approach, not only uh, in this assessment, but um, other work we have in horizontal policies as um, digital transformation. Uh, here is a quick presentation of our advisory council, advisory board, um, internet, uh, uh, interested uh, government bodies and organizations participate and um, continuing the thought of, uh, Mart uh, of uh, 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 Matthias, I would say that indeed the, the involvement of institutions and even the leading role of uh, institutions is very, very important. Uh, so we are trying to support uh, to, get, uh, to, to guarantee quality assurance, legitimacy and transparency. And because you can see the timeline here, we are at the phase four now. Um, and here are the research aims. You're very well aware with them because I, I guess that we are all doing this uh, same exercise for the same uh, reasons. Uh, and here with two slides, I'm finishing because I don't want to take too much time. Um, the national assessment, uh, as uh, you know, it, it is led by multi stakeholder advisory board. Um, we have uh, the diverse backgrounds of members of the board providing different perspectives, um, assisted with developing the research methodology finding and choosing the most relevant sources of information, which is uh, challenging. We all uh, mentioned that and emphasize on difficulties with data gathering. Uh, and I would like now to answer uh, one of the questions that we chose uh, to um, focus on. How could the process of establishment, including the presence of different sectors and groups, consultation, and validation of the results with the uh, MID be improved? Uh, here are our, our thoughts and insights. The involvement of the board of experts that do not have interest in the project should be avoided. The board members should be introduced to all the documents in advance to allow them to provide sufficient and relevant feedback. Uh, the assessment project process and the level of involvement of the experts should be also presented in advance. Um, the direct involvement of representatives of the relevant national authorities in the board contributes to better understanding and raises their interest. So, uh, in, in, in uh, prolonging their involvement and would improve follow-up strategies, we are already looking at the follow-up strategies, such as the enforcement of the recommendations and updating uh, the indicators and more frequent uh, board consultation meetings should be planned as provided, uh, proved successful in our case. Uh, the dissemination of the project, you can see in the slides later on uh, what we are doing. We had seven um, um, events, um, international events that we presented, uh, the project, the progress. So thank you so much for your attention. Looking very much on the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Iglika. Thank you for sharing the experience. And um, Bulgaria is one of the um, excellent examples of uh, countries uh, w where uh, the assessment is feeding into the national strategy. And we're happy to uh, follow and support uh, the process. And thank you f uh, also for your input. Um, uh, the next person I would give uh, the floor to is Alan Giundu, uh, who has led the research in Niger, Benin, Congo, RC, and Congo DRC, um, unless I'm missing one other country. Alan, please, the, f the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Tadvik. Uh, I am going to share my views uh, based on studies carried uh, out in the Benin. Niger, Ivory Coast, Republic of Congo, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'll be talking mainly about uh, gender, children, sustainable development, uh, financial services, and uh, health speech. Um, it's important to highlight the indicator for uh, women, given the gap that uh, exists in access to the internet, in skills and in uh, occupying positions of responsibility. Uh, there are laws in place to promote uh, gender equality for women's access to new technology and education, but the difficulty lies in pinpointing the effectiveness of, the, of these laws. Um, as far as uh, children are concerned, uh, progress is being made uh, with initiative to strengthen uh, digital li literacy. Uh, however, uh, risks such as cy cyberbullying exists, and uh, children's understanding of internet use is limited. Legal and uh, educational frameworks need to be strengthened to meet the specific need of uh, children on online. Uh, activities are uh, con considered essential to achieving the sustainable uh, development goals, but uh, challenges persist, particularly in data collection, e-waste management and access, especially in less connected areas. Uh, with regard to e-waste, uh, most of the country uh, surveyed have failed to meet their international and continental waste management commitments. Internet universality indicator should focus more on this issue. Uh, online banking and financial services have uh, been a real hit with the public, not only because uh, they give them uh, access to low-cost services tailored to their needs and to instantaneity, but also because they enable them to develop online business. I am, in my opinion, this is uh, another area that deserves more attention in terms of the indicator to be put in place. In all these countries, uh, the legal and the ethical framework aims to combat hate speech and harmful behavior online. But uh, enforcement remains a challenge. Gaps remain in reporting mechanism and online trust. However, uh, care must be taken to ensure that the fight against hate speech does not become a pretext to, for uh, curtailing freedom of expression. Uh, to conclude, I'd like to say that this study has helped to highlight data that uh, was not well known to the general public and sometimes to politi political players. Uh, I think that UNESCO uh, should reinforce this visibility by using all the necessary tools at local level. It would be interesting uh, to organize sub-regional forums on the universality of the internet uh, so that people living in the same context can reflect uh, together on these concerns. Universality can, uh, can't just be full of uh, at local or national level, we also need to take a macro approach and encourage the pooling of skills and resources, and UNESCO can play an important role in this. With regard to the UNESCO website, 
uh, it should uh, be pointed out that the reports are not uh, visible and few people are uh, aware of their existence. Uh, we therefore need to adopt a marketing approach, explore the different possibilities of data visualization, implement a push strategy around analytical summaries and conclusions, and make the most of launches and validation. We can also organize in-country events on the various categories. Uh, we need to carry out cross-cutting studies, uh, create communities, involve ministers and uh, their cabinet more closely in reflection on the evolution of uh, indicators and support projects resulting from the evaluation. We need to show the concrete benefits of the study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anon, for sharing your experience in leading the research in five uh, countries um, and for your input and suggestions on, uh, especially also on the last point, um, uh, which uh, gives me an opportunity to make a link, uh, as you mentioned, uh, maybe not as many people read the reports as um, we would have uh, wanted to or aim to. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to the person who reads all of our reports. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Simon, who has been acting as a technical advisor um, for um, a number of countries lately, um, for all the countries who has been supporting and guiding um, the lead researchers, the MAP, uh, and also uh, us. Uh, so uh, he, he's uh, also involved, he's been involved more closely in Thailand uh, report as well, and currently in five South Pacific seats. Uh, please, Simon, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Tatavik. So I, I used to work for UNESCO for um, 2001 to 2012, and then uh, um, I stopped. Um, uh, and uh, But since then, I'm still working for UNESCO. Uh, um, but the thing is now that I do what I want, and I can also say nasty things about UNESCO if I need to, because they're not directly employed by them. But um, I, I was asked to talk about the M and X categories, um, and uh, so I'll do that, but they're, they're easy categories to, to tackle in many ways because they bring out the whole aspect of IUI. So for M, one thing, most of the people, people who've talked recently have, uh, in the past few minutes have been talking about the multi-stakeholderism as applied to running the IUI project, the MAB. But actually the M indicators are about the multi-stakeholderism put in place by the country in, in internet governance. Um, and in, in, in many ways, they, 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 they both apply and they both mean the same thing. Um, but I, I, I want to be provocative a bit on both of that, especially since we're kind of thinking about revising the indicators. So my comment about M is sometimes it feels very superficial. So it's very easy for countries to say, Yes, um, we uh, involve uh, all the different participants. Um, but when it comes down to it, often the civil society feels they're not involved. Um, the East example of this is on e-governance. So many reports I've done talk about how um, uh, the country has a good e-governance structure. Um, most of the policy documents that they're developing are out on the web for people to look at. And there's even a link to allow people to um, send back their comments. But very few countries at all have said, or, or rather most countries have said when they've seen that, but actually they never know whether their comments have been read or taken into account. And I think, for example, in this meeting in the next couple of days, CTIC and so on are going to work with ITU on, on a question of meaningful connectivity. I think one thing which would be nice to see in the internet is meaningful participation. And what does that look like, and how can that be put into the IUN, uh, IUI indicators? And I think that's really, perhaps, to put it another way, about the quality of participation. So, so 
what kind of things, not just a, a, um, the kind of ticking the boxes about um, people are allowed to say, to, to, uh, are consulted, but what does that consultation look like in more depth? And should they be expecting, um, uh, um, I used to be a town planner, and town planners' consultation is bread and butter, and, and you publish the consultations um, for every plan that you issue. Uh, and not that you necessarily need to do that with everything, but that there should be some feedback there, a list of who has participated, as indeed, for example, there is in terms of the development of the, the manual itself. Um, uh, any other points? Well, uh, um, balanced, um, um, maybe we should also think about how the, the MAB is structured. So Matthias uh, um, uh, 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 and then Bulgaria, and then in talking to Namibia as well, uh, uh, um, there's a sense in which we're talking about whether the two formal MAB meetings we have at the beginning and the end, there should be perhaps some guidance about structuring consultations in between. Uh, uh, and I like, uh, as we were talking about in Namibia, the sense of talking to particular ministries and structuring that, that conversation. Um, the more that we have um, those kind of conversations, the more we get buy-in from all the people who are contributing to this. And that's important for seeing reports through. And as Santosh and others have pointed out, that sense of ownership from the government and ownership from civil society, as well as, as Pizal was saying with, with Cambodia, I is really important. So structuring that guidance to, to, to get that might be a, of interest. Um, so I think that's probably what I want to say about M, and then I'll move on to X. Um, X is the best category to talk about because you can say anything, it's all in X. Um, um, uh, and it's cross-cutting, uh, and this is the, the, the problem with X is it's the last one in the report, and the last one in the manual. And I always find that the X is the shortest one of all the chapters, um, and for various reasons. One of them is because X repeats indicators that were used earlier in the report, and again, several people have mentioned that. Um, and, and that leads to, 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 to uh, two things. One of that, as, as Sadaf was pointing out about the whole aspect of, of gender and, and its huge importance um, to UNESCO um, as a principle through ever. And every time we have these projects, there's always a debate. Do you have gender mainstreaming or do you have a separate gender section? Um, and it's, it swings and roundabouts. If, as in IUI, it comes in, in a substantive section at the end, um, it, it, it's often kind of like an appendix. Um, whereas mainstreaming through ensures that you pick out gender in every single um, element of the whole program. But in putting it in every single element, you lose that sense of concentrating a, a final summary, if you like, as, what, as how gender is. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not giving a suggested answer to that one. It's a perennial debate. Um, I don't know what the, the, the answer is. My feeling personally is I'm a, a mainstreamer. I like to see gender everywhere throughout every single indicator instead of putting it at the end. But it is a debate, and I'm not sure about whether that's the right one. Um, and that then links into to what was said about children as well, but not being a... Uh, uh, a section for children. I'm risen to people, a section for old people like me. So that, uh, that also relates to age and gender breakdown and disaggregated data. Um, some things that are in there which are important and, and look forward to, to, I think, new indicators. One of my favorites is e-waste. It's in there, in there under sustainable development, but only as one indicator. But it's a critical indicator, particularly in Asia, um, uh, I know that in Cambodia and Thailand, um, e-waste is dumped by Western countries and left to refugees to pull apart. Um, so there's a lot of issues coming out there. I know that in Pacific, where I'm working now, um, there is no land to put waste in. Um, in some countries, you know, the country literally is, is this high. Um, and you cannot put things in the ground um, because it contaminates the water table. 
um, and they're small countries with very limited fresh water. So that points to that and, and wider importance there. Um, you know, the internet has um, affected meetings in the last few years from COVID through Zoom and online meetings. Um, um, but there, there is a question, therefore, about the positive and negative effects of the internet on environment and sustainability, which doesn't emerge, I think, properly in the indicators so far. And again, to bring out a, a, a specific point, which links to the technology, and it's important to show that IUI has the technological aspects as well as the um, human rights and the social aspects. For the Pacific, satellites are the way. You cannot cable up islands or put masts between islands that are thousands of miles apart. The only way to get, in fact, one person talking to the other with a reliable connection across the Pacific in one country is going to be through satellite technology. Um, and, and we know that satellites, again, are, are the new um, internet platform that are, are going up um, in thousands almost every minute, it would seem. Um, and I don't think that, again, perhaps is reflected in the technology side of the indicators as much as it is. Um, um, like I say, the exit covers everything. I mean, Alan made a good case of cybersecurity. Um, and, and clearly, I, I, I like what he says about that being not just strengthened in the indicators, being strengthened in a way that is recognizable to the public. Um, um, and I like what he said about the marketing strategy. And then finally, this point about data availability. Um, I have a clear strategy on gaps, which I, uh, in the countries I've been working with, um, I set across. So there are five, six priorities. The first one is you want data, preferably statistics, which says exactly what the situation is. And obviously on rights, and that's not what you have. But the second one, of course, then is published um, documents, and that you do have with rights, both in terms of the laws themselves and with the, the, um, um, the, the, the civil society publications or comments on that, and that can go down to results of case law. So, so documentation through written sources, or if you don't have that, the next one is a focus group. And the message there is the focus groups should be planned as early as possible because they may need money and because you need to get names in people's diaries. So if it's a key issue, a focus group helps. The focus group itself is a, like a little multi-stakeholder group, hopefully. So that's why that's there. The next priority, if you can't afford a, 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 a focus group, is a key interview. So again, a key person, even if it's only one, but documented, ho hopefully use their name, get the date there, and put that down. And again, if it's a, a suitable authority, um, the most common one, in fact, has been um, uh, um, um, uh, spokespeople for the disabled. Almost every country has come up with a, a disabled society and the head of that society to speak on their behalf as a clear authority in that way. And then finally, the last one is the gap. If after all that there's still a gap, you turn it into a recommendation to fill it. And that's it. So I think with that strategy, it covers most of the gaps. Um, and um, um, there will always be gaps in data. It costs, you know, $20 or more to add in a, a survey to question to, to regular surveys. But I think that's the, 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 the summary. Um, so I think... Um, that's all I had to say, at least on those two categories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for your work um, uh, with UNESCO on the, on the assessments uh, and also for the individual countries more closely. Um, and thank you very much for your input and uh, ideas. Um, I would now like to ask, uh, give the floor to actually online uh, participants if there are any questions. Um, also, I would like to ask the online moderator if there are questions online for from participants. I see comments from uh, the panelists, but the panelists will be given a final uh, floor. Uh, so if there are um, 
comments from the participants, please do let me know. Um, otherwise, if there are questions which you would like to um, speak and ask, please, online for the moment. Um, for now, wait a second. Um, there isn't any um, questions from participants. There's a lot of comments from our speakers. Uh, oh, discussing for speakers, a, we a will few, uh, yeah, sorry for the speakers, yes, for we the will give them the generation. floor. So no questions from the okay, participants? So no, no question. No uh, questions. If anybody would like to take the floor now and ask a question, please feel free. Sorry, now I'm checking if online participants have any questions. If not, please... Uh, Please introduce yourself and if the question is addressed to a specific uh, speaker. Hi, so um, I'm Stephen Weber from the International Federation of Library Associations. It was in, uh, what Simon was saying about are we talking about multi stakeholderism in the design of Internet Universality reports or in general made me think that um, an, uh, an issue that we come across is that often when you frame consultations or you frame governance questions, as being about digital, you often actually reduce the number of people who want to get involved because they assume it's not what they're looking at. And um, an issue, and it's quite specific, something we come across with in Europe, is that there are some really big, there are some big discussions around AI and whatever else. Um, but these have huge impacts on like research and education and other issues. But actually, the research and education and other stakeholders don't come forwards because of the way it's framed. I, I just zooming out because I know that looks very specific to what extent does it mean that when we're looking at internet universality we're not just focusing on the technical on the internet focus but actually on the universality aspect and that we're looking at how well is the internet working for different communities and therefore are these communities getting involved and I think I mean, this all comes down to the question of internet for what rather than just internet in itself. I hope that was vaguely coherent as, as a point. The other question which I should ask, given um, who's paying me to be here, my employer, is um, to what extent is there reflection on the degree to which we can use both libraries as a stakeholder, but also libraries as a venue for bringing communities together, given that they do have this long experience of being a first point of contact for backup point of access to the internet for people. And so it is that space where people can think about you know, they go online but they also encourage they encounter all the problems they encounter all the difficulties and so they're used to thinking about how they go online at the library is it possible to get people to put that experience into the language of internet universality through meeting in that context thank you thank you very much is there are there any other questions we'll get uh, from the audience no do you want to take the question? Um, and firstly, to say it, it hasn't come out today, but in IUI, um, there is certainly a, a sense of different, want a better word, sectors and, and how the internet functions for them. So, health, employment, culture um, are, are mentioned. The second thing I have written down on my paper, which I didn't bring up, was information literacy. Um, and uh, so again, there, there are one or two questions there. Uh, I mean, for me personally, I'm, I'm certainly a, a strong believer in libraries as the key facility <laughs> for helping people get what they want, what they need throughout the world. And uh, uh, it, it, you know, as you know, it's core to the Information for All program, in which you know, for, uh, I always see as being um, that everybody has a right to be able to find the information they need to um, solve their work problems, look for jobs, in other words, skills to, to for, for training, uh, and solve their health issues of their themselves and their families. Um, and I see that a core element of information for all, and I would like that to be a core SDG of, of some form instead of 1610 public access to information, which we've 
mentioned in Swaram Pitaki mentioned this time. Um, uh, um, so, so it's there. I, I guess for IUI at the moment that part of the problem is it, it's, it's, it's less about, it's more about the internet itself and what it does and how it does it. Um, and, and it's more about that and less about the institutions where you do it kind of thing. Um, there's the usual ca um, question about use of libraries, internet cafes, etc. And do you but, but, I mean, as we know, even with internet cafes now, as mobile phones have come around, that's kind of fallen out of the picture somewhat. Um, but I, I think it would be good to, to, one way or another, libraries have to be in here, I think. It's, I mean, it's, it's the only thing you find in pretty much almost every village, even if it's a passing camel or horse or, or whatever. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you for the question. Uh, so I would just like to add to this that not um, uh, Simon already addressed the uh, the idea around the IUI and libraries. I would like to uh, um, add to to the uh, the idea that. Um, to the point uh, that uh, we cooperate very well with UNESCO, with IFLA, um, and we do believe that they are core uh, in, uh, as he mentioned, disseminating uh, as a knowledge uh, uh, dissemination and also knowledge carrier. So we do a lot of work with uh, libraries, especially on media and information literacy. Uh, so, um, and, and we do a lot of work around that, but, um, but uh, not so far on IUI. Uh, so um, are there any questions offline or online? If not, I would like to invite the panelists to say, um, um, to add anything that they would like to add, uh, giving them one, one minute, please. I know there is a discussion among the uh, speakers in the chat. So I would invite uh, people to speak uh, one minute each, please, in the speaking order as we start it. Bisal, would you like to uh, start? Followed by Maria Fernanda. Uh, thank you. So me, uh, to me, I, I, I would uh, recap in two aspects. Is it important that IUI need to be revised? Yes. I think it needs to be revised to keep it relevant, including technology, but also the way we, uh, we apply it, but also the way we illustrate and the way that uh, we can do a peer review or whatever in terms of uh, keeping the progress. Second thing is that uh, I think the term meaningful, meaningful connectivity, meaningful participation is the most important part. So it's crucial that meaningful connectivity, including digital skill as well, but not only the uh, uh, connectivity as a technology itself or the network infrastructure. Another aspect is that uh, multi-stakeholder participation is very crucial and the ownership of the report is crucial so that everyone will take the recommendation and implement it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Fernanda. Followed by Grace. I don't think she's here anymore. Um, okay, Victor, no, would you like to? Here. Victor, would you like to add a sentence? Uh, so to say something, but I just need to point out that uh, UNESCO has resources. Uh, UNESCO needs to impli uh, to to come up with uh, a budget for implementation. Uh, UNESCO also has that uh, good relationship with governments. UNESCO needs to spearhead the implementation of the recommendations. Thank you very much. By the time the microphone reaches to Victor, I should <laughs> I should remind that this is a voluntary assessment. 
carried out by the governments and UNESCO is always there to support technically and where possible also financially. And uh, I should highlight this uh, again and again, the voluntary uh, nature of the assessment, uh, which also ensures uh, the local ownership. Thank you very much for the... Okay, uh, no, no, I must respond to that because we can't forever be volunteers. Uh, we need resources to conduct some of, you know, some of... Voluntary, the sorry, yes. means voluntary by the government. Okay. So the initiative comes by the government. It's not enforced or it's not, um, it's not enforced by UNESCO. We're there to support. Okay. Uh, the initiative comes from the but national stakeholders. We are giving you good feedback. I appreciate the good feedback. Um, well, I think I'd echo uh, the comments and just to add that um, I think thank you very much UNESCO for coming up with the, uh, the, the Romex and I think we need to encourage um, more countries and researchers um, to undertake uh, similar researches because it helps in terms of uh, benchmarking the situation in different countries and hopefully providing um, useful uh, baseline information that uh, you know, other actors and people who are involved in the sector can take up and, and implement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor uh, Swaran, followed by Santosh. Thank you very much. So lastly, I would just like to say that the role of the civil society is very, very important in strengthening, uh, in, uh, st strengthening the existing legislation and the community at large you know, really need to believe in the power of research because many of the things that we have assessed so far, we have seen that there are elements of, you know, the indicators embedded into certain aspects of different legislation, but the deployment is an issue. For example, in, in some of the South Pacific Islands, we have uh, the Information Act and the right to information is embedded within, uh, within it. And then in some of the Pacific Islands, we see the, Inform the Information Act is there, but there's no Privacy Act. So uh, it sort of contradicts with each other as well. So uh, if, if we um, you know, involve um, the civil society, I think it, would be, it could really make a huge difference. But then again, we do have issues around you know, being too territorial where when it comes to certain governments in less, uh, less developed economies. Um, thank you very much. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much, Warren. Uh, Santosh. Uh, thank you. All the interventions were very important. Uh, as a parting point, I just want to reiterate that both the content and the process is important in IUA assessment. We have to update the content also because it has been five years and there, there has been a lot of development in between. And the process, we have, so, we have to also uh, invest on that. Talking about that, uh, the IUA process itself should not be an end. After the assessment is done, the job done, check mark, that should not be the, from the local perspective, from the national perspective, that is the beginning of the uh, kind of working in that particular country on advancing the internet ecosystem, advancing the, uh, the universality or uh, access or anything. So that should not be an end, but that should be the kind of driving tools for the coming days. And talking about the uh, this uh, process, sometime, we just get lost in between. I'll give you uh, one example. We started the process in Nepal. At that time, there was an IT bill, discussion on IT bill, and discussion on the national cybersecurity policy. Now we have the cybersecurity policy, and uh, the assessment doesn't talk about it. Because at that time, it was just a draft. Now we have done, so, uh, we invested so much time into that, that the policy is there, but not, uh, there is nothing about the uh, policy in the assessment. So if it takes long time, the value is some, uh, somehow we lose the value of the document. So we have to have the, uh, the timeline also very in uh, in, uh, intact, I believe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, you can give back the microphone, please. Uh, Anna? Um, I think um, I should also maybe just encourage um, more more countries particularly to take up this assessment. And although it is a government voluntary um, assessment, I think 
um, the model in Namibia was approached differently because it was civil society who pushed for the assessment to be done and the government managed to agree with us because we had um, we have that relationship so if civil society is also not driving their agenda things will not go as smoothly as they should um, also to just to applaud um, UNESCO for um, the resources that you have availed, both technical and financial, they do go a long way and they and they set the tone for um, the carrying out of the the, the uh, assessment um, um, in a simplified manner. I think um, that's one of the aspects that was really not mentioned um, in terms of the review. Um, of course, each country would have it differently, but um, with the baseline um, indicators, I think they were quite straightforward and um, simple to understand. Where we don't have the resources or the data, it's something else, but other than that, um, it's a matter of taking what you're given and making it yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, actually, on your point, I should uh, uh, correct myself if I said uh, voluntary assessment by the government. It's an assessment by a national stakeholder. So it can be initiated by, uh, uh, by an academia. Uh, it can be initiated by a civil society. It can be initiated by a ministry. So we have cases of diff 40 countries, and 40 countries were all different. So we have cases uh, of uh, basically many stakeholders, of diverse stakeholders who initiated the process. And of course, we receive endorsement also from the relevant ministry. But uh, thank you for pointing this out, which uh, an apologies if I mentioned voluntary by the government. No, it's voluntary by national stakeholders. Um, next, uh, Aileen Zul, would you like to comment, final comment for a minute? Uh, she has left the, the okay. chat, she had to go, so... Okay, Sadaf. One minute, um, please. Thank you. Um, I put it in the chat, a recommendation that I have in terms of, um, um, you know, changing a, as you go on to revise the framework. I'm wondering whether there's a possibility to explore a two-tiered kind of an assessment framework where the governments are voluntarily asked or, you know, I know there is no mandate, but the governments can be asked to submit their own assessment. And in the second phase, a civil society shadow report kind of a thing, um, as we see in the UPR, um, to kind of do away with a lot of duality in or and a lot of contradiction that comes through when both governments and civil society are trying to validate um, the assessment on the similar set of indicators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadaf. I am notified that our time is up, but um, three more minutes, please. I'll, um, uh, I want to hear from everybody very briefly, finally. I'm not going to repeat uh, all the things that have been said already. Perhaps in the update of the indicators and what are the other things should be looked at, I think that uh, a more careful approach to the digital economy and its intersection with workers' right could be something interesting to look at because it's something that is going to grow even more and perhaps in the AI revision could, could be something included. Uh, and then also perhaps this new narrative of digital public infrastructures could also be framed within the internet universality indicators as something to look at how states are thinking in their digitization. Not only talk about the e-government as a result, but the, the process also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Matias, do you have one final thought to add uh, just for a minute? Okay. I. I think he might have left as well. Iglika. Yes, left. Iglika left as well. Okay, Alan, would you like to add one more last uh, word? Yes. Um, I think uh, for me it is uh, uh, very important to think carefully about the follow up to evaluation. Uh, and um, I think that we need also to communicate more about the benefits of assessment, the actions taken and the progress 
made thanks to the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And one final word, Simon, you don't have to. Okay, um, so before um, before I close, um, I yeah, I, I would like to thank you uh, all uh, to the speakers uh, so very much for all the work and excellent cooperation that we had over the, the years. And thanks so much to uh, Setik, Alessandra here, and Fabio here for the excellent cooperation. Actually, I, I brought the uh, Brazil report uh, as one uh, the first report. Um, um, I have only one copy, but we're digital, so you can see them online. Um, and also to all the speakers and experts online and to all the participants online. Um, this discussion really will feed uh, um, into the revision process. We, we have excellent input and recommendations for, uh, from speakers, uh, which uh, we will um, uh, look at carefully while uh, revising the, the document. Um, and um, we, we will be having another session. Uh, of dynamic coalition, there is IGF dynamic coalition um, on uh, internet universality indicators. Uh, the session will be on the um, on the tenth of. Um, Okay, sorry. Uh, on the 10th of, I, I'm notified that there is another question, but I'm really sorry the time is up. Um, the, the, the participant is welcome to join on the session um, on Wednesday. Um, it's at uh, uh, 2.40 local time. Um, and it is in room 11 or room J. We will be, but we will be able to address the question. If you leave us your, uh, the participant can leave us uh, their email address. We, we will be happy to um, answer the question by sending an email. So thank you so much all. I know it's been a very long session, but um, before we close, I invite um, all the speakers to have a family photo. And I would like to ask the online participants to please turn on your videos. Uh, and finally, I should give uh, thanks to to the IUI team at UNESCO and my colleagues who've been working online, uh, Karen Landa and Camila Gonzalez. Um, thank you so very much for your ma moderation and not taking it for your uh, hard work. I would like people to see your faces. Uh, I know it's a Sunday uh, morning, early morning in Paris, uh, but um, uh, thank you so very much. Yes, um, and please let's have a photo. Yes, you can give an applause if you want. <laughs> thank you very much. Maybe we could stand there. Uh, have the participants, online participants as well. And maybe instead of the room.